Good morning and welcome to the fifth meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone, I'll do it myself as a, 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 an exemplar, can I ask everyone to make sure that their mobile phones are switched to silent and while uh, you may use devices for the purpose uh, of social media, please uh, don't record or, or film proceedings. We have our own people who do that for us and they're all publicly available. Uh, so. Th uh, we, can we start with the first item on our agenda, which is a roundtable evidence session uh, on detect cancer early. This session is part of our wider preventive uh, uh, agenda inquiry. Uh, I'm Lewis MacDonald. I'm the convener of the committee and an MSP for North East Scotland. And I'll ask everyone, please, to introduce yourselves uh, round the table, starting with Ash. Good morning. I'm Ash Denham. I'm the deputy convener and I'm an SNP MSP for Edinburgh Eastern. Hello, I'm Janice Preston. I'm Head of Service for Macmillan Cancer Support in Scotland. Morning, I'm Miles Briggs. I'm Conservative MSP for Lothian and Spokesman for Health and Sport. Good morning, I'm David Morrison. I'm a Consultant in Public Health Medicine and Director of the Scottish Cancer Registry. Hello everyone, I'm Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm Lib Dem MSP for Edinburgh Western. Uh, good morning, I'm Jenny Goldis. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Eager to get ahead. Yeah, um, no. Good morning. I'm Gregor McNee. I'm the Head of External Affairs with Cancer Research UK. Uh, good morning. I'm Jenny Gorris, the constituency MSP for Mid Fife and Glenrothes. Good morning. I'm Emma Harper. I'm one of the South Scotland MSPs for the region. Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. Uh, I'm Bob Steele. I'm a co-director of the Scottish Cancer Prevention Network. Uh, I also chair the UK National Screening Committee. I'm Annie Anderson and I am Director of the Scottish Cancer Prevention Network and Professor at the University of Dundee. Uh, good morning, Ivan McKee, MSP for Glasgow Proven. Good morning, Christine Campbell. I'm a reader in Cancer and Primary Care at the University of Edinburgh. Good morning, and Brian Whittle, South of Scotland MSP and Scottish Conservative Spokesman on Health Education, Lifestyle and Sport. <laughs> uh, good morning, Sandra White, MSP for Glasgow Kelvin. Hey, good morning, Ewan Patterson, RCGP Scotland and uh, ex-GP in Govan for 30 years. I'm David Stewart, I'm an MSP for Highlands Island Region. Thank you very much and a warm welcome to all of our uh, uh, guests this morning. Can I start the questions by asking uh, about the, the rationale for the Detect Cancer Early programme, which clearly is uh, at least in part in relation to late diagnosis and late presentation in Scotland compared to other countries. Uh, do could I ask witnesses uh, for any views regarding what contributes to that late diagnosis? Please just indicate, and, I'll, and uh, questions will be through the chair, but just indicate when you're having a, a ball. There are a number of uh, reasons for this. Uh, it's partly due to the fact that uh, many people will delay going to see their GPs with symptoms. But it's also partly due to the fact that in some cancers, symptoms are not a good, uh, they're not good indicators of early disease, uh, which is why we have screening programs in breast, cervical and uh, uh, colorectal or bowel cancer. So I think there are, there are two main issues here. And, and could, do you have a view as to why Scotland relatively uh, shows a, a greater tendency to late presentation and late diagnosis than, than other comparable countries? Well, uh, I think it's, uh, I mean, there are various um, issues around you know, levels of deprivation and uh, I think, uh, and we also have to think about the actual causes of cancer. I mean, Scotland has traditionally had uh, behaviours which are not um, conducive to cancer suppression, if you like, uh, so there are um, there are diet, smoking habits, lack of exercise, which have contributed to the uh, a large incidence of cancer in Scotland. Excellent. Are there other witnesses who would wish to? Uh, Still raised around the what we describe as the patient interval. So for the time from a patient first spotting symptoms to then presenting a GP, and that in interval can sometimes be months and, and even years. Um, you're asking convener about Scottish differences in that regard. Um, I think international evidence will point to UK differences, which um, are grounded in our relationship with the NHS um, in, in the UK. And there, there is a uniquely UK um, view that we don't want to overburden a, a system we all hold in, in very high regard. And I think um, that, that plays out in a lot of the evidence. 
if we're looking for more Scottish specific issues, um, a, a lot of public opinion testing will discover a strand of fatalism that exists in deprived areas in particular. So there's, there's a healthy level of fear that's required in a population regarding cancer. We want people to be, hold it in, in some fear in order that they do present, but um, when it's, it drifts into fatalism, that, that becomes disabling. And um, we hear concepts like um, the big C and cancer means curtains and, and that sort of thing, or, or even that I'd rather not know. And these are concepts that are particularly prevalent in deprived areas in Scotland. And I think DC programmes made some efforts at, at challenging those, but there's, there's obviously a long way to go. A, a general practice perspective working in Govan for many years, um, not just the sort of absolute deprivation, but the, the gulf that exists and is increasing between the haves, people like me and the have-nots, a lot of people I was trying to serve. And that not only does that induce fatalism, but there's a, a, a loss of purpose, a loss of hope, um, just what is the point? Um, and that can be extremely frustrating and very difficult to overcome. We could struggle to get people to go back for review who have been diagnosed with cancer. Um, I mean, it's that, it's that big a problem. So I think that underlying this, I, I suspect a lot of this is, is, is global inequalities. And we see that writ particularly large in countries like the UK and, and the US. Kristen Campbell. Right, everyone, uh, what, what other what my colleagues have said, and related to that is the issue of literacy and health literacy. So I think we, we deal with the wider context of people's lives there too, where yes, there's fear and there's fatalism, um, but that's but but when we try to address that through information and awareness campaigns, um, it's really important that the language that's used is appropriate, um, and that's where a lot of DCE E efforts have gone in in different ways to try and address um, giving the messages in a way that people will, will take on board. Thank you very much. Sandra Hart. Thank you very much. Just a, a, a small follow-up as someone who was born in Govan and uh, <laughs> uh, there and uh, still have relatives there. I, I know exactly you know, what, what you mean in that respect to garden fatalism. Uh, I just wonder if uh, we should perhaps be putting more effort into the fact that because you're diagnosed with cancer, certain types of cancer, it doesn't have to be a death sentence. Uh, we should maybe put that forward more rather than, OK, we have the screening, which is great. But the fact of the matter is, you know, McMillan and, and others, you can actually live with cancer. Do you think we should be maybe putting more resources into that message, particularly in certain areas? Um, we've got a lot of insight across the UK in the fact that people in Scotland are mi more financially stressed. I also think we've got a bit of insight from Easter House, where we did a public health study a few years ago, our health improvement, where people said they didn't trust health messages. So I think there's something when health messages are made national that doesn't reflect what you see out your window. And there's something about making that real to the people that live there, building that trust and working with communities. Uh, can take Alex, call Hamilton, and then and the others. It's an extension of this wider point about attitudes to health messages, and I think particularly in deprived communities, but actually in all communities, um, certainly around cancers affecting the bowel and the genitals, I think there's a, a natural embarrassment about seeking help, and we try and break that down through national messaging campaigns, but we still don't seem to be getting it right. There was a, a, a report just last week about uptake of cervical screening based on the fact that women are embarrassed about being examined in that way. Um, how do the panel think we could be doing better in breaking that embarrassment down? Back to prevention, really, in terms of, of messaging, because um, there's, there's a huge gap in terms of raising awareness about preventative action for cancer, and that's not covered by DCE, and it is a huge gap within this country. So, and there isn't a person who's been diagnosed with cancer who doesn't wish it could have been prevented in the first place. So while your question is very much about after diagnosis, but, but we must think earlier. In prevention. <laughs> I, I'm sure we'll come back to the prevention. Gregor McNeil, did you want to come back on, on that previous question? Um, which was around um, challenges to presentation where it um, involves invasive tests. I mean, um, I think technology has um, a lot of potential solutions around that. So in the cervical screening programme, there's um, 
there are pilots going on, one in Dumfries and Galloway, around home testing rather than having to present in a clinic. Um, so um, that involves you doing it yourself rather than have um, a nurse um, do the test for you, which obviously will break down barriers for some. Um, I think the, the next win on the horizon, if you like, is around the, the bowel screening test and the new um, FIT test, which, which is on stream now. Um, but that involves taking one sample rather than three. Um, and evidence is showing that breakdown that breaks down a lot of barriers for particularly men, particularly those in deprived areas. Um, and we would really um, impress on Scottish Government to to give that test a, a real push and make sure the public are well aware of, of that change and um, how much easier it is to do. Janice, I think you wanted to come back as well. Yeah, I think we've uh, got a growing amount of evidence that suggests that the venue and where you have some of the discussions doesn't need to be within a health setting. So I actually, I remember a couple of years ago when we launched the service in Renfrewshire and the libraries, people came in and saw the kit and started talking about it, realised it had posted a couple of months before and started to uh, inquire about it. So there's just something about making it more visible and ha having those conversations. So I think our work with libraries across Scotland now is demonstrating, and people have quoted many times to us, it feels like a safe space. And where there's barriers, maybe going into a health environment, actually our community spaces are spaces we need to use more. Alison Johnson. Um, I have to confess my question is about prevention. So we'll come back to you. Thank you. Right, Pamela, I think you want to come back. In relation to embarrassment, that's a huge issue, and there, there is work going on um, across Scotland. Um, we in Edinburgh do some, but do so, so do colleagues in, in Glasgow and many other places, really trying to do qualitative interviews, focus groups with men and women um, in different um, communities to understand some local issues. Um, and I think one of the key things is the power of narrative, the power of stories. If people see someone like themselves either at a health forum um, or at a local event or in their supermarket talking about having been screened, having done the kit, um, that, that's a very useful avenue. And I know CRUK, um, local primary care engagement, try and do a lot of that sort of thing too. Okay. Miles, I think you had a question regarding deprived Thank communities. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to um, expand kind of the point um, Janice just made there in terms of how we could develop that further. Is this something we need to look at in terms of... Um, planning as well to look towards community health hubs so that people have that um, forum to be able to discuss this and different charities could use that that space and mm -hmm. and in terms of you know taking messages to people is there ways potentially for us to link in with for example the bookies mm -hmm. where you're maybe more likely to have a conversation with someone there and mm -hmm. what sort of works ongoing or examples um, the panel would know about where we could do that here in Scotland yeah. <laughs> I think from a uh, okay, yeah. mm -hmm. um, from our perspective, uh, I think there's a there's lots of evidence now to suggest that the improving cancer journey in Glasgow, which we're spreading to Dundee and Fife just now and other places, and hopefully in partnership with the government, um, that actually it's engaging with 80% of the people in the most deprived areas. So the people that are taking it up from those areas. So there's something about that community venue and shared community space that makes that easier for people to access. Uh, once people, 61% of them come from DEPCAT 1. And what we're finding three months on, if you do that needs assessment of all their needs, their financial, uh, their practical, their emotional needs, as well as their clinical, three months on, they feel able to self-manage and their growth and confidence is enormous. enormous. So that point in time, I would say, is when people are receptive, not just them, but their entire family. So I think there's something about building on that teachable moment, that point in time. But I think absolutely those community spaces and how we use them cross-organisationally, collectively, I think would be a huge plus. Sure, supplementary, Sandra. What? Small, um, picking up on Janice's point, in, in my constituencies in, in, in Glasgow, Kelvin, uh, like the, the, the annex in Partick, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, to capture mostly men who don't tend to go to their doctors, uh, it's a drop-in centre, a cup of tea, play dominoes, whatever it may be. They're used to going there. So you think we should use these facilities more because they're not going there to a health centre. They're going there that they would normally do once or twice a week but they've got the access to testing or whatever that's there. Absolutely. I think men's sheds or places like that uh, are ideal. But 
we, we mostly use volunteers, so it's people in local communities voting other people, managed by the libraries, but actually going wherever people are. David Morrison, do you have a view on, on that area? Oh. Um, I suppose more from my past experience as a screening coordinator, I think one of the challenges is actually we need technology that's better, because I think, you know, we all know that the, the screening tests in all their forms are... are in various ways, uh, un embarrassing and uncomfortable. And I think one of the, the positive things about the new FIT test is that it is easier to do and quicker. Because the real practical challenges that people have to take a bowel motion sample and to do a, a, a screening test have been, I think that's one of the reasons that men, and to be honest, people who are less resourceful, find it quite a challenge to get everything together. Um, and with cervical screening, you know, I, I think what we can all fully understand just what a, a, an embarrassing and a sensitive area it is. Um, so I think there's also a challenge in the, the medical profession to be thinking of developing future screening tests that are just basically more pleasant and easier to do. And, um, and I will welcome when we find an easier way to do screening tests that just don't impose nearly so many barriers on people. Thank you very much. Annie Anderson. Just coming back to community approaches, so I was one of the research team who designed Football Fans in Training, which is a weight loss programme carried out through the Scottish Premier League, and I know various charities have been working, like Bell Cancer um, UK, to try and raise awareness through football clubs, and there clearly is a huge opportunity there, and a door has been opened through Football Fans in Training that I think, in, in terms of cancer awareness, it would seem an obvious route to go. Certainly one I know very well from Aberdeen and I know other parts of the country as well. Um, on, on the issue of the impact of Detect Cancer Early, uh, one of the things that was uh, striking, I think, was evidence that there was an increase in consultation without necessarily an increase in diagnosis. I wonder, I think Ivan McKee had a question on, on, yeah, on that. Thanks very much, uh, thanks very much, convener, and thanks to everybody for coming along this morning to talk about this very important issue. Yeah, it was precisely on that point. If you look at the data over the last number of years, there's been, um, in terms of stage one diagnosis, the number has increased, but very, very slowly, and very limited progress has been made there. But then, for example, if you look at the data on colorectal cancer referrals, you see a significant increase in the referrals, but hardly an in stability, into, uh, in actual fact, in terms of the... Uh, the number of detections. Um, so is there an issue there about we're targeting the wrong people or is there an issue about the way that GPs are dealing with that um, and uh, what are people's thoughts on that? Bob Steele. I think this, this is a, a really challenging issue. The problem, particularly with bowel cancer, is that the symptoms of bowel cancer are symptoms that everybody gets every day. I mean, rectal bleeding, abdominal pain, change of bowel habit, they're common symptoms. And uh, very rightly, there's been a drive to increase awareness about these symptoms. But the problem is that lots more patients go to see their GPs, and the GPs are really faced with a situation which is almost impossible. I mean, they've, they've got a patient with symptoms that could be due to bowel cancer, and they don't want to ignore them. So there is a drive to use, actually, the FIT test at a more sensitive level to help GPs make a decision as to whether or not an individual should go on to invasive testing. The problem is if, if too many patients go to have colonoscopy, for example, what it does is it clogs up the waiting list so people who actually need it uh, are delayed in getting it. So I think what we have to do is be more clever about having tests that will help GPs make a decision on the patients that they have to deal with when they come to them with symptoms. Ewan Patterson. Of the NICE guideline group that looked at the revision of referral for suspected cancer. Um, now, okay, that doesn't cover Scotland, that's an England and Wales um, issue, but I was there through RCGP. Um, and one of the things from that that is just, it, even, even symptoms that you would think are really, really, really serious have a fairly low predictability for actually turning out to be a cancer. Um, like, oh, a diary on its own. Uh, is less than one person, the, the PPV is 0.94. It's a tiny, tiny number. And, and big things, even bleeding, is not that common the first time around that you see it. And so I think it's, it's, it's one of the, the areas where I think the, 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 the term that I, I think is used well by Mark Marshall is the GP is the boundary specialist trying to sit across these boundaries and work out exactly what to do with incredibly complex situations. 
And the complexity comes not just from the complicatedness of the symptoms that are, are presented, but the index of suspicion that arises from the fact that this is somebody who never comes to see you. And therefore, the fact that they have come, all the hackles, start, you know, the antenna start to wave. That is born out of serial longitudinal encounters and continuity, which in turn, apart from giving that narrative which was talked about earlier, which is so important, it also hopefully will engender a degree of trust and start to break down some of the, the embarrassment things. It's probably easier for an old man to have me examining his bottom than somebody he's never met before. Uh, and that's the reality of it all. To do that, though, you need a, a, an adequately resourced and adequately staffed general practice workload. And I do mean general practitioners because I still think that the, the, the real deal with, with doctors is that when we were at university, we were trained to make diagnosis and plan treatment. The rest of it's a bit of a bolt-on, but that's the real deal with, with, with doctors. And expecting other people to take on that diagnostic role outside of continuity, outside of relationship, I think will present some significant challenges and may adversely impact on detect cancer early. Ivan, did you want to come back? Uh, I, mean, I understand it's a, it's a complex system, the, the relationship between what you're seeing as the symptoms and whether or not it is cancer is, is, is complex. Um, but a lot of that can be modelled. I mean, is there enough data there in terms of understanding what, where you need to look and where your best percentage of finding it is based on what you're looking at? And are we direct and coming on to the cost-benefit question? One of the things that was striking was that a lot of the responses said there isn't much in the cost-benefit analysis going on. Is, is that something that we maybe need to be better at, understanding where to put resources to get the maximum who would effect? Like to, who would like to respond to that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. On, the, on the point behind putting things together, and, and I suspect that the idea of symptom A, B, C, D, and E coming together, um, the the work that the the Nice guideline did would would suggest an urgent referral for suspected cancer if the if the overall positive predictive value was above two. So that would mean that 98 of these people that were referred did not turn out to have cancer. Okay, so the hit rate is pretty small. And, and, and that's, that, that, that's, again, the reality. So you, you're, the, the, the additional danger then is that if, if you target resources into ensuring that these people are seen timiously, which is incredibly important, but it means that people who've got a PPV of 2.5 wait for an inordinate length of time before they get seen. So the, 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 the not quite bad enough but not okay group can get a really raw deal if we're not careful. Did you want to come back? That's right. I mean, there has been a huge amount of work done in trying to look at different symptom complexes, but it's not very effective. And the most effective tool that we have, I think, as NICE has picked up at the moment, is using a sensitive test for blood and stool. Because if someone does not have blood and stool, the chances of having serious disease are very, very small. So it's just it's something else in the mix. Um, so, so when you have a simple blood test as for prostate cancer, for example, is, is the argument that that should be more widely extended or that it should be more targeted? But we're talking about uh, um, you know, uh, the, the same test that's used for bowel screening, so it's actually looking for blood in stool, except set at a much more sensitive level just to pick up very small traces. So there isn't any peripheral blood test that will be helpful in, in, in that context. You said in response to Ivan's first question, we need to get smarter at identifying. Um, who, who we should be targeting. How, yeah. how, how can that be done in the context of what well, Ian Patterson's described? Yeah, as I, I think a, a combination complex. of symptom complex and testing, and at the moment the best test we've got is a test for blood and stool, and I think that sort of combination is, is probably the way forward. And it's about assisting GPs. It's not about telling GPs what to do, because as we've already heard, GPs are professional people, they're doctors, and they, and they make sensible decisions. Uh, Gregor, please. Um, I think we can also look at the, the context of, of once referring patients on um, how we can gain efficiencies within the, that side of the system. <coughs> so um, it always helps me um, understand the context that GPs are in when we think that eight to ten, um, there's, they only see eight to ten cancer cases a year on average um, out of six to eight thousand appointments. So that's what they're trying to sift through in terms of cancer. Um, and then when it comes to referring to secondary care, there may be um, efficiency to be had about perhaps offering more direct referral pathways for GPs so they can themselves <coughs> refer directly to some diagnostic tests where currently you'd be looking at a model of going to someone in secondary care, 
then making an, an assessment, perhaps on a conversation again with the GP, again with the patient. And we hear anecdotally, and there, there is data behind that, you, you do get patients sort of bounce around through the system. So there's probably a value to be had there around um, building capacity in the system and also improving patient experience in, in that regard. David Morrison. Well, just to pick up the, the question of cost benefit, which I know was raised in, in my Understanding of cost benefit is it's quite a broad thing. You've got a set of costs and you've got different kinds of benefits and you can put costs against those. And I think that helps to open up the debate about where our resources might best be put in terms of the primary prevention, stopping people getting cancer, making, a, as uh, Gregor has said, making the systems more efficient to get people through to an early <coughs> diagnosis and to be treated effectively, and what we can do to make the experience of cancer a less... Uh, uh, onerous one and, and difficult one. Um, so that cost benefit is actually, I think, a big question. There is a more tight question about cost effectiveness, which is if you've got one effect, which is how can you detect cancers as early as possible, what's the cheapest way of doing it? And I think that's what we've been rehearsing so far. I think that question and the use of the word cost benefit is quite a useful one because it starts to raise that question about where in all of the experiences of cancer can we put our different resources and I think we, you know, we need a, a distribution of resources to, because we can't do everything at every point, we can't prevent every cancer, we can't cure every cancer and we can do something to palliate uh, cancers that we can't cure. Christine Campbell then. To the discussion. Um, one is that I think we have to think of, of not a long, long term agenda, but certainly not a quick fix. So it's important to remember that awareness campaigns, for example, um, have to be sustained because the people who, us, who will get cancer at some point, we need to have these messages in mind. So there's a need for sustained awareness. Um, people take time to absorb these and for behaviour to change. And then that will eventually we trust through time feed into um, sort of that broader cost benefit um, issue. But can I just pick up on the issue of, of health systems um, because it's important to, to remember there's research going on both in the UK and internationally to look at still keeping a primary care gatekeeper or boundary role but how triage and um, redesign of the health systems um, or tweaking the health system to allow faster referral of the appropriate people. Um, just point out two things. There's, there's pilots going on in England around fast track. There's a Danish a redesign of the Danish primary care for cancer symptoms that looks at high suspicion, medium suspicion and low suspicion. And there's a lot of evaluation going on at the moment of that particular um, redesign to see what's the optimal um, pathway for patients ultimately um, and there's also the international cancer benchmarking partnership that Scotland is part of that's comparing patient pathways in a number of different jurisdictions to try and learn what we can about um, optimal design. A brief supplementary David Stewart and then uh, thank you, convener. Uh, thanks very much for that contribution. I, I was interested in looking <coughs> at cancer survival rates uh, uh, across Europe, and so you n touched nicely on international studies. You know that last month uh, Lancet published the third Concord study, which compared countries across the world in terms of cancer survival rates. Um, it's obviously done on a UK basis, not a Scotland-wide basis, and on memory we come out extremely well as far as all cancers for children are concerned, around fourth, uh, but not so well when you look at colon, where we were 17 out of 28. There's obviously big comparisons here. Would the panel like to say why the survival rates are so different in different European countries? It's really important to realise that these studies, and I'm sure that uh, David Morrison will want to comment on this, but these studies are not always comparing apples with apples because we have such good cancer registration in this country that uh, we have a very accurate knowledge of survival rates, whereas other countries with which we're compared have actually got, some of them get very poor cancer registration, so you're only looking at a very small proportion of the population. So I don't know whether the new Concord study has dealt with that or not, but it always strikes me as a significant problem that I think we sell ourselves down um, because of that. Mm -hmm. Steele. I mean, I think that's a very useful point. The, I think, quick glance at the study, there was actually 71 countries being looked at, but the, the figure I quoted was within the EU, within the 28. So we were fourth out of 28, but a lot lower for colon. So I think the point I'm making is, even if you look at different types of cancers, why are we different even within the EU, which is fairly advanced 
NHS relative to some of the other countries in the 71? I think, uh, I mean, even within the EU, I think in Germany, for example, cancer registration is about 7% of everyone with cancer. So, you know, even within the EU, these comparisons are dangerous. But, I mean, I, there are certainly differences f between the UK and the Scandinavian countries, for example, where we are pretty sure that uh, the, uh, that the, um, the comparisons are similar. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's probably got r related to fairly simple things like levels of deprivation and, and, and uh, smoking rates. But uh, I'm sure others will have an opinion. Um, I agree with, with Bob, what Bob's saying. I mean, essentially, these kind of international comparisons, European ca um, comparisons, um, uh, Eurocare is the other big international European comparison in cancer survival, which have repeatedly shown that the United Kingdom's survival rates for nearly every cancer apart from skin cancers do relatively poorly. And the biggest gap of all is in lung cancer. Uh, where nobody's survival is particularly good, nobody's uh, country average survival is particularly good, but the gap in the UK is particularly large. And, and to rehearse what those discussions are, I mean, as Bob says, one of the issues is that at an international level, we don't have the fine detail that tells you this is exactly the same kind of patient at exactly the same stage with the general other illnesses and comorbidities, if we'd call them, that contribute to their ill health. Um, so we have to look at a fairly high level and we say, could it be an artefact? Is it just that they're being selective? And I think that is true in some countries, but it's true that the Scandinavian countries return 100% of all their data. So it's not the only explanation. Um, but I've done some other work with, uh, with colleagues in uh, Germany and trying to uh, understand some of their lung cancer patients and who they are out of all of the people with lung cancer who are selectively come to their specialist centres. I think it's the same story when you look at uh, information from the United States. Um, people tend to report a, a selective best case scenario. Uh, then you're left with questions of saying, is it that we're getting worse kinds of cancers? Are they more aggressive in some way? Is it the general health of the population? I think that's some of it, but we use a thing called relative survival. So you're comparing your population with what you would expect within your own population. Um, but general health obviously contributes to people's survival anyway and their capacity to be able to take some of the more aggressive types of cancer treatment. So being in good health is, is a good way to, to tackle cancer on top of everything else. And for Professor Still, I think that was very useful. Could I just throw one other comment in? I'm not meaning a judgment in this comment, but Professor Coleman, who was the author of the study, and I summarise his view, suggested the reason there's a difference is because that similar European countries, the proportion of GDP uh, has spent in health are higher, and the UK has not spent as much as other European countries. Now, I know there's a big debate about this. I think the Sunday Times had an article about how the inflation rate in health is a lot higher than normal CPI because of technological changes. But he makes one view as the author of the study. Would you agree or disagree with that? Well, that's a highly political question. Um, and I'd be cautious about coming down and, and saying that that would explain everything. Um, but it's true, I think, as we've rehearsed already, there is, a, there is an element where you're looking at the efficiency of a system that you have to accept that in order to be able to capture patients who might not obviously have uh, cancer, and, and let's face it, there's one thing to say that people seem to have symptoms of cancer. A lot of people are diagnosed by surprise. It, it's an incidental finding. You're not principally expecting them to have cancer. <laughs> that you have to allow a certain throughput, a certain amount of investigations to be able to identify uh, people with cancer. Um, so uh, trying to be highly efficient and trying to capture uh, people at the earliest stage of the diagnosis is a difficult balance to strike. I'm not um, necessarily going to um, side with M Michelle Coleman's uh, view on whether that means a change in our total budgets, but um, as I say, there's certainly a cost that comes with investigating more people and accepting that a lot of those investigations will be negative. John is present. I think uh, one of the things that I like most about to take cancer early is how ambitious it is. And uh, the last thing we should do is to drop that level of ambition to be the best instead of concentrating on why we're the worst uh, or one of or how it seems. Um, but I think we have an, a, a unique opportunity in Scotland to shift this. So I think when it comes to cost benefit in particular, if, if we were to change that statistics in the more deprived areas that 29% are diagnosed late, whose life expectancy is then very short. That, the, the benefit to that is 
to the communities, to Scotland as a whole, is huge. Macmillan, as you know, are focused on people with cancer. And we are, that's where we invest, that's where we focus our time, and that's where we will continue to do so. But we have a community engagement that is unparalleled by any other national agency. The trust that people have in Macmillan is enormous. And so there's a real opportunity to get to the heart of those communities and ch shift that story. And if Scotland don't grasp that, and it's not by investing in Macmillan or Macmillan Invest, it's about the wider collective joining in Macmillan and actually adding to the work that we're doing. I think we could shift that with prevention messages, with detecting cancer early, with screening. Ian Park. I suppose it's jumping back slightly, which is to the why are we worse, if we are indeed worse, or if it's just about poor registry and poor comparison. Um, and, but if we are, and, and maybe I'm making taking a slight leap here, but there is good solid evidence that some fairly impressive health and social metrics like life expectancy, maths and literacy, infant mortality, homicides, imprisonment, teenage births, trust, obesity, mental illness, including drug and alcohol addiction and social mobility, are worse the greater the divide between the haves and the have-nots. And I don't think it would take much to extend that to possibly why we're not doing so well with things like cancer, because these are the factors that will play out in every single health and social situation that every single person in this country suffers with. Um, and I, I, it, I think it, it bothers me that, that we still seem so unwilling to acknowledge something that seems so staggeringly obvious and will have if, 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 if that was addressed in part, the, the benefits outside of detecting cancer early, outside of preventing cancer, would just be enormous. Brian Whittle. Um, 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 thank, thanking convener, and uh, you've actually led me very nicely into the, the area of, uh, I wanted to address. Um, I, I, if I could ask a, a, couple, a couple of questions, I'll just start off with, with the, the influence that um, the sort of 10 minute GP appointment has. Uh, on, on the t detection uh, levels and uh, the influence, perhaps, of, sort of poor access to GPs, if I could start with that. Um. <laughs> That's coming my way, then. Um, <laughs> looks like it. Uh, yes. Uh, I, well, uh, I, think, I think the simple answer is that ten, 10 minutes nowadays is woefully short. When I started in general practice in 1985, we had 10 minutes, um, and that was more or less adequate, I think. In my time in practice, the, the, the complicatedness of health and care and treatment and decision making, I, I think it, it, feel, it felt exponential to me. Um, and I think we also introduced a, a whole raft of complexity and, and in many ways very, very, very good things. I think far, far more natural involvement of the individual we were with. Um, rather than the, the doctor knows best. And uh, even as, an, as a young GP, that didn't quite feel right for me, but it was still quite prevalent, I think, 35 years ago. Um, but the time that we've got with people hasn't changed at all. Uh, so, uh, yes, it's got to be inadequate now. And if you look at the population that we are creating through social um, interventions, through health interventions, so on, we are creating a, a, a very elderly, very frail multi-morbid population, many of whom will suffer with dementia. Uh, I mean, in the, within the next decade, dementia will become the commonest cause of death. Uh, the majority of people I suspect in this room will peter out in a care home. Uh, and <laughs> well, I, I, being, being one of the older men, I'll be one of the first, so that's, that's the, the reassuring fact. But, but, but that, I mean, you, know, you talked about cost benefit, but the cost of providing care to that population that we are creating will be astronomical because these people will require what I would call observed care. They will not manage to look after in the family home. It's very difficult to look after someone with end-stage dementia in the family home. So these people are heading for bed somewhere. Where? I think that's your next topic this morning. Um, so that's just a marker for that one. Um, so I, th I think that, that would be, I've, I've kind of gone on a bit, but 10 minutes is, is not adequate. Follow me, I think, I think can I? Sorry, sorry, convener. I think that uh, it kind of led to where I wanted to go, um, and I think we're asking our GPs to do more and more. And I think it was uh, Professor Anderson you, you did discuss the, the the prevention agenda and the idea that uh, in, in terms of cancer, the sort of smoking, obesity, alcohol, lack of physical activity has a, a, a huge part to play in this. 
And I think I wanted to, to look at the, 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 the social prescribing that, 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 uh, that we ask our GPs to do, uh, and we're saying we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, time to do that. So, that. so the access to opportunity to be active, uh, especially in deprived areas, and get that advice, uh, get in, included in society. Because to my mind, if we were active, you know, you'd be less likely to smoke, you'd be more likely to be in control of your weight, you'd have a better relationship with food and drink, you know, that redress of that fatalism or, or, or lack of hope or, or, or achievement and to be included and, and have better mental health. So I think, I think that in terms of the, the sort of cancer prevention, where, where, are, where, are we with, where are we with that? Because to my mind, that's a big element of, of, of tackling high levels of cancer, specifically in deprived areas. Annie Anderson. <laughs> There's quite a few options in there, aren't there? I think cancer prevention is hugely missed. It's the elephant in the room people don't like to talk about. It makes people feel guilty. Um, uh, health professionals say they're not trained in the area and they're there to, to, to treat. Um, social prescribing is something that is of great interest. Um, I don't see it rolled out as widely as it could be. At the moment, we are leading on the ACT Well programme, which is inviting uh, women with attending routine breast screening. That's women without breast cancer, um, but at a teachable moment um, where they're interested in cancer to say, would they like a lifestyle um, intervention? And we're delivering that within the leisure centres in local areas. Um, we're finding that people don't really like coming into leisure centres. They're big, they're sweaty, and when women aren't used to going into them. So we are offering that opportunity. We're making that link, but we're also listening. I mean, I think physical activity is one part of the lifestyle um, complexity. I don't think it's the sole route to getting people through to thinking about food and drink and obesity. It's an important part of that jigsaw. We've got to get wiser and smarter about how we introduce prevention. It should be part of all health professionals' role. The Health Promoting Health Service Initiative and um, within secondary care should be flagging that up. Sadly, it isn't. Primary care have a role, but they're busy people. And uh, I think we need to look at the totality of where the opportunities are. Within the DCE um, work, um, we recognise that screening and opportunities for screening are an opportunity for talking about prevention. And as I've said in our paper, um, I think that should be explored. We've got evidence that women, uh, people like it, they take part in it, and it's something that we're missing so hugely. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I completely totally agree with all of that. Um, I think the, the problem in, in it, again, I mean, this is just one of these great examples where the inverse care law is writ large. Um, it, it, it sometimes amazed me how much time and effort I would need to put in to try and encourage some sort of lifestyle change. And I can be very persuasive when I put my mind to it. I really can do that. Um, and yet it was a struggle. Whereas it would be relatively easy to get me to shift my mind. And yet you'll have the same, more or less the same GP workforce per capita across the whole country. Um, whereas in, in deprived areas, clearly th there needs to be more time available to, to make these sort of very complex behavioural change interventions. Sorry, the point I forgot to make about the ACT Well um, study is that the people doing the interventions are breast cancer now volunteers that we have trained up an intensive programme. And we've had hundreds of people coming forward to be volunteers. So we can develop community capacity on prevention. Um, and the Act was rolling out now, but just from the preliminary findings that we've got, that's an opportunity we ought to be taking. Listen, Johnson, and then... Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I really appreciate the focus that there has been this morning, I think generally, on health inequality and the impact that has on, on everything we're doing. Um, I suppose... I, I've been on this this um, committee since since the beginning of the session, and we've done quite a a, a lot of work on prevention. Um, and I think the message that's come across loud and clear is that messages are preventative for some people, but they seem to be the ones that the messages reach, and then they act on them. And in some ways, it increases health inequality. Um, so it's about how we reach those people that that messages don't uh, reach. And I'm 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 getting the feeling here. We also heard, I should say, from Dr Helen Irvin and Dr Margaret McCartney, whose views on screening were perhaps quite controversial, um, that perhaps that wasn't the best focus for uh, for money. 
Um, I don't know if we want to go into that, but I suppose what I, th I think what I'm hearing from Dr. Patterson is that longer point longer appointments could be preventative. You know, I've visited the Govan Ship project, and the impact of GPs having that bit more time could be a way of, of reaching people for whom an exercise programme might just be too challenging at the moment. Yes. And, and as I think, as a uh, as a signpost into something, I mean, one of the things that that. Um, I think I enjoyed the, a fairly high level of trust from most of the people I was attempting to serve. And me suggesting, um, pushing, encouraging, coercing somebody to, to go someplace sometimes, made, and that might have been an appointment for, to be checked for something, it might have been a screening appointment, it might have been a, a live active referral, whatever. Um, and so I think that, that sort of uh, relationship at the start of it all is, is hugely beneficial, and that takes time. There was some good work from Scandinavia, oh, five, maybe more years ago, um, and I can't remember which, I think it was Sweden, and the, the, it was estimated that it took about 10 or 11 consultations between the same two individuals in primary care for a trusting relationship to develop and people then to feel that they could work together. And that's a lot of time, uh, but that's maybe the sort of time that is needed if we really want to see some transformation going on. I would not in any way underestimate the importance of using social prescribing, uh, things like the, the Lynx project, again, great stuff. That's absolutely, and, and it's, not, it's not only about general practice, but I wouldn't like to see it forgotten about. Mm -hmm. Can I, just ask Please. I mean, do you see a combination of both of these approaches as some of the most effective primary prevention strategies that Scotland could be leading? Is there anything else that, that uh, you know, we need to point out? Is every, I think all the initiatives are very good and absolutely need supported and continued. But what's missing in every submission pointed to it was that we rely on that health interaction. And the trouble is that a lot of people don't go there until too late. So I think there's something about that working through communities. So you mentioned the Link Officer Programme. Again, we've got two Link Officer Programmes. We've got Improving Cancer Journey, which the Scottish Government is committed to spreading with us, um, which is a social prescribing model and it is reaching 80% of people. And you have another Link Officer Programme that is based within a GP surgery that relies on people going through the door. So I think what we're missing is that whole community effort round about if, if we've got good engagement there, how do we build those messages on to it? How do we start to change the conversations in communities? How do we reduce the stigma? How do we use our safe sp spaces where people trust and use organisations that we trust, but just build on them, not duplicating any effort? So I think Morris, we could do more. David Morris. Um, well, this question about primary prevention, because much of what we've been talking about so far is once cancer's developed, how can you <coughs> treat people as, as effectively as possible and try and cure them? Um, let's be positive and say we have achieved quite a lot in terms of smoking, which is the single biggest preventative, uh, uh, preventable cause of cancers, but we still lag behind the rest of the UK, so I think further effort is still needed. It's, it's an old story, but it's still one we need to keep pushing. Um, I think there's good news in terms of the, the minimum unit pricing policy that we're uh, about to bring in in Scotland, and we hope to see that bring down consumption of alcohol. But as I said in my written submission, there isn't a safe level of alcohol. Uh, I'm afraid there isn't a story there I can reassure you with that if you want to minimise your, your cancer risks, then no alcohol is the best policy. Um, and then the question about overweight and obesity. I'm just taking three of the, the most common, and of course there's a, a longer list. Um, we're not doing well on that. We're not turning the, the corner on that. Two-thirds of our population are overweight or obese. I think a lot of people don't realise that it's actually such a major risk factor for some of the most common cancers, like breast and bowel cancer. Um, so we've, I think, still got a, a long way to go, both on the old enemies and some of the ones that we've not tackled so far to try and reduce cancers ever occurring in the first place. Can I take Sandra White and then Gregor and then Christine? Uh, thank you very much, Convener. It was one of the areas that I really wanted to concentrate on was the prevention area. And I think Jan is, you know, her, you know the point there. Uh, we have been talking about people presenting themselves to the doctors, etc. But I see preventative as being you're, you're healthy enough not to have to present yourself to the doctor. And that was the way I wanted to, to look at it and the opportunities that it would give us. Uh, you know, obviously, 
budgetary wise I wonder if there's enough money spent on the preventative part i.e advertising I mean you mentioned uh, Dr Morris in regards to obesity etc if you're from a deprived area obviously to feed a family you'll maybe go to some shops and I'm not going to name them which you know a lot of the food is not healthy as well so I just wondered if more educational wise we, we should be looking at it we are doing a lot of work with exercise particularly in Glasgow free entry into gyms etc the football that type of thing as well but really to get that message out to the community can we use the, the child poverty bill that's going through the, the parliament to link that into preventative you know just how can we use some innovative methods and they're actually not innovative but hear about the Mediterranean diet constantly how do we get that across to people that the diet they use and obviously minimum price and alcohol is fantastic but we should be looking at uh, some of the stuff that goes into our food stuff as well you know and, and, and maybe labeling or, or stopping that as well so I'm just want to open that but I think to try and prevent it we need to educate people into eating better and uh, that type of thing uh, uh, Gregor Oh, yeah, I mean, I think Sandra's, um, sort of um, setting the scene on there's been a lot of um, good discussion around um, local projects and a lot of um, ways we can encourage individuals to think about lifestyle and um, Ewan's talked about the, what he can do within a GP setting but um, is that connection once they step out of the practice what environment are they, are they stepping into um, I remember hearing a Govan Hill um, Deep End GP talking about um, for their patients there's no fruit and vegetables within their walking distance I mean that's the context where we're talking about so it, it has to go hand in hand with looking to shift the what the, the academics and the wonks will talk about the obesogenic environment but it, it's where the the unhealthy choice is easier and often perceived as cheaper um but actually looking at even the average supermarket which cancer research uk is challenging that environment somewhat in terms of um, high fat sugar salt promotions but actually the the cheapest foods are the whole foods so um the, the cheapest way to eat is still rice and pasta and, and whole foods but there's probably um, an education piece there about um, cooking skills. Um, also, there is there is the promotion environment. So the, there's plenty of science and, and nudge theory, etc., that shows how people um, people's behaviours within retail environments do change depending on promotions and what's um, on offer. Um, and at the moment, that's balanced towards the unhealthy side of things, and um, that really needs to tip towards the the healthy side. Um, so these sort of environmental interventions, like MUP, like around promotion of unhealthy foods are also absolutely vital. Christine Campbell. Thanks. I'm going back to, to an earlier point, but it might pick up on something Greg has just said, and that's around our, our broader um, prevention um, agenda and long-term thinking. Um, and how do we get people, how do we get all of us um, to think about that? And I think that's where education is, is really important. So we don't have schools around the table as far as I know, um, but thinking about... Um, fizzy drinks, thinking about what kids have got available in school. There used to be, when I was in school, health economics that picked up about how to cook well and how to eat well, even on a budget. Um, colleagues in Stirling um, and elsewhere have been doing work with the Teenage Cancer Trust on raising cancer awareness among young people, uh, without frightening them, but with giving the dual message of here are cancer symptoms um, that might that you need to think about, but here's broader healthy lifestyle thinking. Um, so there's a dual approach there. And I come from a university sector and just picking up again maybe on the discussion um, around a, a health promoting health service, including prevention in the curricula of nursing students, medical students, allied health professionals, sports, um, the, the whole sports science agenda, so that it becomes part of, of a broader curricula, um, I think might be some ways forward too. Emma Harper. Thank you. I just want to pick up on the lung cancer that uh, David uh, brought up. Um, I'm interested in that as I'm the cross-party group convener of the Lung Health cross-party group and we are looking at a respiratory quality improvement plan for Scotland and it looks like we're going to get um, a person, Dr Tom Farden, to look at a quality improvement plan for Scotland which actually is working in Wales and Northern Ireland. So I'd be interested to hear if you think that is something that could then look at tackling lung cancer even though it's a quality improvement plan that will focus on lung health in general. Of that, so I can't say, but uh, one of the, the things to draw out of this discussion, I'll start with lung cancer, is that what is 
um, good for your general lung health will be good for lung cancer. So not smoking and not being exposed to environmental or occupational risk factors for lung diseases will also greatly improve or reduce your chances of getting lung cancer. Because even if you do smoke, then the, the interaction with other uh, occupational exposures can, can worsen things. So any strategy to improve lung health will be a useful strategy for lung cancer. But as we've been talking about some of the other issues to do with things like obesity, it's also worth saying in this context that what's good for cancer is usually also good for heart disease and for stroke and for dementia and for a number of other chronic illnesses. Um, so that uh, we're not sitting in a silo with cancer here. I think a lot of what we're looking for to try and improve the general health of the population will be good for all of us. Um, the answers are, are, of course, complex. And in terms of the, the question about obesity, I mean, the Foresight Report, a superb report and broad thinking, but if there's one takeaway message, and that's that there isn't a single issue. Education is not the only answer. Health interventions are not the only answer. Um, it's immensely complex. In a sense, tobacco is one of our easiest ones because there's no good in tobacco. Um, but when it comes to our diets, then we have to really understand people have to eat and we have to understand people before we can think of something that's fair. Thank you very much. Uh, Ewan, yep. I think it's, it's very much linked to that. I mean, in, in the 30 years I worked as a GP, I, I honestly think there was one person in that entire time that I encountered who smoked, who had a level of learning disability where they really didn't understand the issue. But there wasn't a single other person that I saw who didn't know that smoking gave you cancer. And maybe some of the other stuff as well, but cancer was the big one. That's not enough. So it's not, that, that's an edge, that, the message is out there for, for the obvious one. Um, I, I mean, I, I mean, as, you know, if, 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 again, let's go around the table very quickly, but you don't need to answer this question, but this is a, a group of highly privileged individuals. Okay, so, you know, everybody hands up if your BMI is between 20 and 25, your fat index is less than 20%, you do your five fruit and veg. Now we're in no alcohol. Oh, my goodness, that's not good news. Um, you don't smoke, you don't do drugs, and you exercise for at least 30 minutes a day. So if anybody's actually doing that in this highly privileged room, maybe not. <laughs> well, a couple... Um, I'll leave now, um, but, but you know, my, but my, my point would be that, that that's two out of about 30 odd people, and yet we're trying to suggest that this is an education message that we need to get across the general community. So uh, it's just to be, to be cognizant of that. And the final point, I guess, is around obesity, and maybe it's just that sometimes I'm over-influenced, but I thought the series of programs entitled The Men Who Made Us Fat of about maybe five years ago were really powerful. Um, and it, it, this is arguably a result of aggressive marketing and consumerism and that's an underlying social malaise but that's what's making people fat. Yeah. Annie Anderson. Okay I think we have a lot to learn from tobacco control in terms of other uh, lifestyle factors so it's taken a long time perhaps two three decades to get where we are in terms of, of pricing availability and you have to look at how did that happen because it didn't just happen overnight and the legislation that we've got wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been popular enough to get the thumbs up from the electorate so um, you could argue that the first stage on that was, I'm not going to call it education, but I'm going to call it raising awareness of the risk between um, tobacco use and health. CRUK are doing stellar work at the moment in raising awareness around obesity and cancer, but we've still got diet, we've still got physical activity. And we have lived for such a long time in this country with these bland messages about activities good for you. Physical activity can help to prevent cancer. We need to get that message out and be clear about it. Um, actually, it helps other things as well, but let's get the cancer message out loud and clear. That's what the tobacco control people did. They raised the bar in terms of awareness, and then they got people on board. Where are our role models? Where are the health professionals saying, we need to do something about cancer. We used advocacy from really important people in our communities, and we need to work on that before we could even get people saying, yeah, we ought to be doing something about the marketing, about the pricing, about availability. And it isn't just about children. Tobacco control has always embraced young people smoking. And Christine, you're talking about children and students. Cancer prevention is possible for adults. We know that um, even after the age of 50, postmenopausal women, we can help to reduce the risk of breast cancer. 
So let's not vote, call it education. It's awareness, it's advocacy, it's role models, it's getting people on board. Let's not just focus on kids, it's the whole population. And at any age, these lifestyle changes can help to reduce cancer and, by the way, diabetes and heart disease together. Thank you very much. Jenny Goodruth. I'm just drilling down then on Sandra White's point with regard to education. Has, are you aware of any work? Does the strategy need to look now more explicitly? And I know uh, Professor Annie Anderson, I thought was quite powerful there when you said physical activity can help to prevent cancer. And I know it's not all about children, uh, but Christine Campbell, you said none of us around about here to do with schools. I, I was formerly a teacher in a previous life and you talked about um, schools banning fizzy drinks, for example. That's a campaign we've got going in Fife at the moment. The Courier um, have a campaign to ban energy drinks in school. And I think that's a really good example of how schools can take action um, to, to try and inform behaviours. So it isn't just about school children or uh, younger people, but presumably if we can get in earlier and have an impact on people's behaviours, that can impact upon you know their, their chance of contracting cancer later in life. Would you agree then that there needs to be more of a connection between health and education? Because one of the things the committee keeps hearing is that there is a disconnect between health and education. And certainly in our session with Dr Burns, he talks about that with regard to ACEs. Um, the two systems are not talking to each other. They're not adequately sharing information. Do we need health and education to sit down and audit the health and wellbeing curriculum area, which is one eighth of the school curriculum? Do we need to, to really sit down and look at the, the detail of that? I mean, I understand again to being um, president-elect of the UK Society for Behavioural Medicine, so I'm going to use my theoretical basis there. Um, yes, clearly working with children and parents. Cancer is a disease that um, has a life course impact, so early years are really important. What we see, and we're seeing a lot in children, is that the education now around food in particular is very good in Scotland. Uh, there's a difference between what you hear and knowledge and education and what you do. I mean, one of my party pieces is in an audience to say, who knows the five a day message? Everybody puts it up, they've learned the message. How many people eat it? It's about 3%. So education and health is, is, is so important as a basis, but let's not uh, lose the bigger picture. So parents going through every, every aspect of the life course. That's entirely true, and I, th I think I'm a huge believer in the teachable moment, and that isn't just the person that's got cancer, but that family round about. And I think even in schools, there's something about not not wrapping things up in cotton wool and just actually using the experiences that'll be in school every day to talk about those things and join up health and school. I absolutely think you need to ground it in reality. Somebody told me the other day their kid was getting resilience training for the second day, but they didn't quite understand it. If you can ground it in the reality of a situation they're going through, we've got a programme in Lanarkshire called Give Us a Break, geared in 10 to 14 year olds going through a difficult time, not bereaved, just change. Actually, at that point in time, they are open to uncovering their own strengths and using them and building their resilience. But when you teach it in the abstract, then they can learn the messages, but it doesn't get acted on. So I think be bold and use the opportunities in school. Talk about cancer. Thanks. Ash Denner. Thanks, convener. Um, I'm going to change the topic slightly here um, because I wanted to pick up on something from the written submission of Cancer Research UK. So it was about this idea of GPs referring directly for tests. So obviously at the moment, if somebody suspects that they might not be well, they obviously go to the GP. The GP, if they think they have, then refers them on to a secondary care specialist who then orders the tests. So there's obviously a potential there. If the GP commonly might know which test to order, that they could refer for the test straight away, which obviously could potentially save money and obviously free up some outpatient time as well. So is it, does everybody think that's something that we maybe could be looking at in Scotland? Um, I think it's um, something that should be looked at. Scottish government are looking at um, one strand of that around um, di direct access to CT scans for some um, big suspicions. Um, yeah, I think you, what we're hearing more and more anecdotally in the data is showing that patients are often bounced around a system to end up getting the test that the GP would have asked for in the first place anyway. And that so long as we're redesigning systems that is those patients that are referred directly and it's not um, a huge amount more patients that don't need the test. Um, and there's again, there's strong evidence in some pilot areas where where it is being used quite well, that direct access is, is not being overused and normal fears you might get in secondary care about um, the system being overwhelmed or are not being borne out. So um, I think there is a lot of opportunity in, in that area. Okay, thank you. 
I had a couple of other... Uh, Ewan, did you want to respond to that question? General practice has a reasonable amount of access to a reasonable amount of tests, probably covering a lot of the, the more common tumours. Um, direct access for CT scanning, which is available in some of the boards, but not all of the boards, is probably more for people who the likelihood is that the boat has been missed. Um, these are people who present with the sort of, you know, the triad of losing weight, loss of appetite, and tired all the time, but nothing much else. And clearly there's something serious going on um, at many at a biopsychosocial level, it could be anything almost, but a, a, a quick CT might well get to the bottom of it rather than bouncing around the system. But they're probably not going to be people who were going to make a huge difference to their life expectancy. So. Thanks. Uh, David Stewart, I believe you had a question. Brian Whittle. May I, I wanted to go back. I mean, you, you, you and Patterson um, touched on it, and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. Professor Anderson touched on it as well around the, the fact that uh, everybody knows that smoking gives you cancer. Uh, and yet, uh, and there's, there's been such great work done in Scotland around um, uh, reducing the, 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 the number of people who actually smoke. But when we dig underneath that, underneath the data, we find that in the top 20 percentile, it's 9 percent of people smoke, and in the bottom, 20 percentile, it's 34 percent of people who smoke. The actual people who could probably afford to do that the least. So there's obviously something else going on here uh, in terms. Of, I think you again you touch sort of that fatalism type thing. Are we are we putting enough resource? I think obviously we know the answer. Enough resource into that area to carry on the great work that's been done in, in this place. How how do we take that that on and actually tackle that major inequality? Gregor McMahon. I think you're right, Brian, to touch on the the idea that health messaging to some of these constituencies is probably not the, the way to approach tobacco, um, the challenging tobacco use. Um, I think a lot of data will bear out that for those whose health, me health messages would penetrate, they probably have given up now, and the, the mission is a harder one in some of those deprived areas. Um, and it's probably different motivators required to, um, to push on uh, in terms of quitting. Um, and that might be around um, the, the control that nicotine can take over someone's life. So the, um, the idea of buying more freedom, more independence in your life and the freedom from nicotine dependency, uh, it might be about around finances. Um, but you're also trying to break what are um, what in many cases is, is quite a social glue. And in, in a lot of these postcodes, smoking is very normal, as you point to. I mean, we're, we're touching 40 percent. So you're you're sort of challenging um, very, very normal behaviours in, in that sense. Um, I mean, Cancer Research UK are, are investing a lot in research and the potential of e-cigarettes in that regard. And so long as these devices are in the hands of smokers, we see a, a lot of potential in terms of moving people from tobacco. Um, and so far, the data is that um, they are being used by smokers rather than being taken up by those who are not smokers. So we think there's a lot of potential in that area. And um, if um, I think we need to try all we can in what's an, an, increase, an, an extremely challenging area. So um, that would be the one area we'd probably point to in terms of um, potential wins. Annie Andrew. Um, with respect to health inequalities in areas beyond tobacco, obesity is a very good example. In, in the paper that we've submitted, we do highlight uh, two studies that we've been involved in, which brings prevention together with screening programmes. So in our Be Well study, we, um, for people who'd had a positive bowel cancer test and had been invited for a colonoscopy, that had not had cancer but had an earlier lesion, so they had a polyp and they had that removed, obviously at higher risk of cancer. We offered people then the opportunity for a weight loss and physical activity programme, which was a very successful paper in the British Medical Journal. We just published something recently to show that there was no difference in response by social demographic group. So there's an opportunity. We all know uh, that uh, people that come through screening aren't necessarily the, the whole population. People from poorer areas are less likely to come through. But we forget sometimes that a lot of people from poorer areas do come through. And there's an example of an opportunity. They were given something and they responded equally well to it. Similarly, with the ACTWELL programme, I've already mentioned when we did the pilot study for that. Now, in breast cancer screening, you've got 80% of women coming through. Not everybody from deprived areas, 
but a lot of women from deprived areas come to screening. It's an opportunity to offer something, and what we've seen so far is that the uptake is high. There is no one way that I think any of us could address the health inequalities issue, but I think what we should be looking at is things that can make a contribution. And what we've demonstrated that is that offering lifestyle programmes for people that are coming through screening with a teachable moment um, seems to do equally well for people from deprived areas. I hope Jan is present. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think it's whoever's got engagement, it's making the most of that point of engagement. So actually, I don't think it's about lots of extra resources. Or I think it's about how we work together to make the most of every, every engagement. Ewan Patterson. Yeah, I suppose it's my slight worry, and maybe I'm being overly pessimistic about it, is that given that these are the people who have attended for screening, um, already the, we're, we're, we're tipping the balance against people from deprived areas because less of them are going. So I think though it will be a small difference, inevitably that will further widen the gap in health inequalities. I think the other thing is that, that that's, I mean, these are great points of intervention. You go for your screening and crumbs, you get a lucky escape. No wonder you begin to get a wee bit more motivated. But the problem is the people who haven't had that point yet. And I think that's what I will, I mean, it was easy enough to, well, not easy, but you could, encourage people to think about things like smoking after they'd had their infarct then they'd be going like oh maybe this is yeah well maybe you were right yeah let's stop now um but up until that point it was very different so um, you know it's 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 I, I i still think we have to do more for the people that we're not reaching at all sure but would you ignore the people that it's an opportunity that when they might never come through another health service would you say oh because we can't get them all then we shouldn't do something and that's and the, cost, and the cost benefit from all, yeah, absolutely. Harper. We talk about health inequalities, but that covers areas that are rural and urban. And for me, I'm a South Scotland MSP that's pretty much a rural area. So are there specific challenges or things that we could be doing different? I know, for instance, that our local National Farmers Union group have engaged with the National Health Service um, lady to go to the auction marts and engage with the farmers to do health checks, blood pressure checks, things like that. So that's a pretty unique thing that's happening in our rural area, but what can we be doing in addition? Uh, Bob Steele. So I think that's a really important uh, point because deprivation in rural areas is different from deprivation in city areas. When we looked at uptake of bowel screening, for example, and breast screening, uh, by deprivation. And what we found was in cities, there was a huge difference between deprived communities and non-deprived -de communities in the uptake of bowel screening. In rural areas, there was no difference at all. So what we're measuring using the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation in rural areas is quite different from what we're measuring in, in, in city areas. So I think we need to take a different approach to deprivation in, uh, in rural areas. Uh, what that approach is, I think, you know, is, is for us to work on. But uh, it's not all about one size fits all. Is it a, a variant of the kind of targeting other witnesses have talked about? I think, yes, I think that's yeah. exactly right. Okay. Uh, Janice Preston. I think, um, I mean, we've got a, a mobile bus that um, is growing in its use, but actually we target more remote areas with that. And again, there's that opportunity to to attach on other messages, we find the uptake in those areas is really high given the population. So it's a, a good use of our, our time. But I also think no matter where people come from, if you don't uh, do that more holistic needs and identify, you know, sort, if people are worrying about where their next meal is coming from, or they're, then they're not going to engage in messages about prevention or getting better. So you have to, what we've seen in Glasgow, the 80% that take it up, and we're doing 5 and D. If you have that conversation and sort those other things out, which you can do through current resources, not new resources. So in Scotland alone, 17,000 people were helped with their benefit advice last year. £45 million in one year. So actually, if you can sort those out, what we're seeing is three months later, they're absolutely receptive to that conversation because they're in a better place and that wouldn't matter where you live. To respond to the, the question about um, rurality, um, I think we still actually have a bit to learn about what the variations in, in both early diagnosis and access to care are. And I'm, one of my academic 
um, pieces of work at the moment is to look at access to radiotherapy services across the country to see um, whether in fact that's a barrier to getting to, to radiotherapy services because they can't easily be moved and made local. Um, with respect, so specifically in terms of breast screening, um, there are mobile vans, and I know within Greater Glasgow and Clyde, there's an initiative to to make those services more accessible, to use them more in a more uh, helpful way, um, to try and to to, uh, to reduce the kind of travel barriers that people who don't have access to a car have. So I think there, there is both a, a better understanding to be had just to see what kind of the barriers there are. Is it getting to a GP? Is it getting to a screening service? Is it getting to a hospital? Um, I don't think we've got that fully laid out yet. The evidence is a, is a bit thin, so we need a bit more work on that. But I think there are also some practical things that we can be doing, and in some cases that we are doing, for example, in reorganising the mobile mammography vans. Thanks very much. Miles Briggs. Um, thank you, Convener. I wanted to um, touch upon the future of Detect Cancer early in, in terms of the focus to date, which has obviously been the three um, main cancers of lung, colorectal and breast, which account for about 43%. And to what extent does the panel feel other cancers have been neglected in that case? And I think this week we found out that prostate cancer now is killing more people. Um, than breast cancer. And so I'd just be interested in, in the views of the panel um, going forward where they would like to see um, detect cancer early develop, especially around some of the rarer ones, be it brain or um, prostate, and any views <coughs> the panel may have. Who would like to kick off on that, Bob Steele? Well, I think in terms of the different cancers, y you have to be very careful about what can be done. The prostate cancer is a very good example for it. I mean, there's been a lot of interest in screening for prostate cancer, and we know that it does more harm than good. And that's a really important principle that you don't introduce a screening program where you're actually going to cause more harm than benefit. And prostate is really difficult to get at because even symptoms are not predictive of prostate cancer. So putting a lot of uh, effort into an area like prostate cancer until we know what would be effective interventions would perhaps not be uh, all that valuable. And some of the rarer cancers, again, uh, are very resistant to early diagnosis. Um, I think, um, th but the other, you know, the sort of reverse of this is, I mean, detect cancer early, I think, has has been a, a fantastic opportunity. And uh, I think a lot of the work they've done has been uh, amazing. But it is not focused on prevention. And I just wonder whether we should be moving to a situation where we're looking at early detection and prevention together. Uh, and uh, we might get more bangs for our buck uh, in that way. On, on, on that point, the, uh, when the Scottish Government established Detect Cancer Early, they set a target of 25% increase in detection or uh, 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 examination at the first stage of these targeted cancers that Miles Briggs mentioned, but fell quite far short, the figures fall quite far short of that target. Is Would you offer an explanation as to why that is? I think it was because it was a hugely ambitious target, and why not? Yeah, yeah. So, so is the conclusion of that that you set a less ambitious target or that you maintain... No, certainly not, just keep pushing. <laughs> question about what we should do next. The, the other thing, because I, I absolutely accept what Bob is saying, that a rational approach would say uh, it's difficult to find good symptoms. I mean, if the, people do the obvious things. If someone's obviously got symptoms of cancer, a GP will refer them. Um, but one of the surprises in Detect Cancer Early was how much early detection of lung cancer increased of the three. And you might not have predicted that because lung cancer is, you know, the symptoms of a chronic cough. We're talking about people who are smokers anyway and might have other uh, lung diseases that go with that. So one might not necessarily have predicted that that would be such a large increase in the early stage disease that's being detected. And I have to say from other audit information that's carried out on cancer services, the evidence is that more people are getting curative surgery and survival, even in the most recent years, is starting to really increase as a result of that. So you can be pleasantly surprised, and I think detect cancer early, you, if I had to be pessimistic, I'd have said lung would be the one that would be really difficult to shift, but actually it's shown a, an increase in early detection, which is um, both welcome, and it just shows you that you can't necessarily guess what you're going to succeed with. Gregor McNeil. Following David there, I mean, 
the, the success in Lung is um, probably beyond what many would have imagined, and I think the the challenge now is to build on that and do that more. There are there are more people surviving because of that, so that's the the human story behind that. I think the the DC program in general will be needed more with an aging population. We've talked about the the early detection challenge, and that um, that very much relates to people with cancer and. Um, the, the efforts around that have to be maintained. Um, we've talked before about public awareness and um, being being willing to present with symptoms, and that, that needs continued investment. It just needs continued feeding those, those messages to public to present and um, to know what's normal for them and to report to GP if that's changed. And the prevention agenda, the, the other four in 10 cancers, but also the benefits to, to wider disease as well. Um, I would contend that 40, billion, 40 million that DC program um, has um, behind it wouldn't, wouldn't touch the sides of a proper pre prevention effort. That I think we need to look to the wider 13 billion of the health budget and really challenge on how much um, is going into prevention and um, we need to put some, some big investment into that area. Ewan Patterson. Um, just thinking back to the lung cancer thing, one of the, um, again, from the, from the NICE work, there's, there's the, the symptoms are, are not particularly good as positive predictive values, but you've got a pretty good test that you can offer somebody that's actually relatively well taken up and isn't particularly embarrassing, so you can send somebody for a chest x-ray. Now, that's not the be-all and end-all, but it's a great place to start. So if you've got vague symptoms and a normal chest x-ray, then the role of the general practitioner is often in undiagnosing rather than diagnosing, and you, you can be relatively confident within some degree that the person is okay. They might need a little bit of watching over the while, but they don't necessarily need to clog up an expensive acute system. But th that, and ditto with, with introducing um, <coughs> for bowel cancer. Thank you. <laughs> Couldn't get the word out there. But introducing that as a, a, a you know a point of contact test. What and we used to do that. I mean, not with fit to be fair, but that was something that was withdrawn. But that would make a huge difference. Uh, so these are these are big big benefits. Final final question, Emma Harper. The point that uh, I think it was um, Gregor McNee brought up at the first was the self-testing for HPV for um, the, the study or the trial or the pilot that's happening in Dumfries and Galloway could prove to actually be something pretty amazing because of the time it will save for people engaging in appointments or and then you take a wee kit home instead. That could actually be beneficial all round to the people who are, there's 5,000 women in Dumfries and Galloway who are defaulting on their smear test right now. So that was something that you brought up early on that I think is actually really could be a good thing. Bob Steele, I wonder if you wanted to respond to the previous point. I, I know that it was uh, one that you had. It, it wasn't particularly important. It was just to say that the, the previous test that was withdrawn was not sufficiently sensitive, but the new test is much more effective and much more helpful for GPs. If, 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 if I was to summarise in a, in, a, in a sentence the uh, message that we might take from this evidence session, it might be that uh, continue to be ambitious on detection but do a good deal more on prevention. Is, that, um, is there anyone who doesn't support that view among our witnesses? Uh, if not, that allows us to reach a consensual conclusion to this session. Can I thank you all very much for uh, your input? It's much appreciated. Uh, we will now take a short break uh, before uh, our next session. Thank you very much.
item on our agenda is two evidence sessions on care home sustainability. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome to the committee this morning in public session, uh, Fraser McKinley, the Controller of Audit and Director of Performance Audit and Best Value with Audit Scotland, and Claire Sweeney, the Associate Director. Welcome. And I believe, Fraser, you are going to open uh, your evidence session with a short statement. Thank you, Convener. A very brief opening statement from me. Um, thank you very much indeed for inviting us along today. And we were um, fortunate enough to listen to that fascinating evidence session. So delighted to pick up uh, on any issues that the committee have following that discussion. And um, while it's fair to say that we haven't done a lot of work specifically on the sustainability of the care home sector, we have, as you know, on behalf of the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission, done a lot of work over the years on the sustainability of the health and care system overall. And uh, we are very pleased to uh, answer questions from the committee on, on those issues today. Um, I think there's probably two reports I would highlight that we've published in the last couple of years, um, uh, just to give you a flavour of the kind of work we've done in this area. Um, back in September 2016, we published a report on social work in Scotland, um, which sets out how effectively councils specifically we're planning to address the financial and demographic pressures facing social work services. The reason we did that work was that um, at that time, obviously, integration authorities were coming into being, uh, integration joint boards were being set up, but we felt it was important to remember uh, that s local authorities still had specific responsibility for social work services, uh, and, and that was why we focused on that uh, area. So in that report, we reported that the current approaches to delivering social work services uh, were not sustainable in the long term. We estimated that if councils and IGBs continued to provide services in the same way, that social work spending would need to increase by between 510 and 667 million pounds by 2020. That's somewhere between 16 and 21 percent increase. Um, and we also recognised that social work services faced significant challenges because of a combination of financial pressures, demographic change and the need to implement a wide range of new legislation and policies. So we highlighted that there's a real need to engage the public in a debate about how we deal with the challenge because indeed, as we heard earlier, all of us are likely to need some of these services at some point in the future. The second report, Kameen, I just wanted to highlight today was uh, the report we published back in March uh, 2016, which was called Changing Models of health and care and uh, the, the, the point of that report really was to to look at the whole system of health and care and to try and draw out some of the more innovative and changing models uh, and different ways in which health and care services uh, were being provided particularly evidence of services being shifted to uh, provide care in homes uh, or in people's homes or in homely settings in that report we found that um, new, new approaches to health and care were being developed in parts of Scotland, uh, many of which were aimed specifically at preventative measures and indeed we've heard about more of some of those this morning. But I think we also recognise that the transformational change required to meet the growing demand for services was not happening fast enough and the new models of care were generally speaking small scale and not widespread. Uh, and one of our conclusions in that report was that the Scottish Government could do more to help make that transformational change happen uh, and remove some of the barriers facing boards and councils in trying to make that work. Um, and finally, in that report, Convener, uh, we showed that the growing number of people with very complex health and social care needs, particularly frail older people, together with continuing tight finances, means that the current models of care were unsustainable. Um, uh, just finally, Convener, we're carrying out more work on health and care services in particular. We're planning to produce our second report on the integration of health and social care uh, later this year. Um, and obviously, we'd be delighted to speak to the committee about that when it publishes. But for now, we'd be delighted to answer any questions the committee has. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. I wonder um, if you could start from uh, essentially where your uh, statement concluded with the response of the Scottish Government to the uh, uh, a report uh, on changing models of health and social care and their response suggesting that the health and social care delivery plan uh, meets your recommendation there. I wonder uh, how far you believe that to be the case and whether there are things uh, you, th that, that uh, uh, need to be reinforced there and in particular whether it provides enough clarity to public bodies in carrying out their duties. I'll, I'll kick off, Convener, and then ask Claire to come in if that's okay. So, 
it's funny as I was preparing for today, I was reminding myself that this is um, this is now nearly two years ago. Um, it's amazing how time flies in March 2016 since we did this report. And uh, and I think um, while I think there is, as we've heard, a lot of good stuff happening, uh, the government has been active on many fronts. I think the the delivery plan sets out a direction of travel that feels like the right one. But my sense is that some of the stuff we found two years ago is still the case, which is a pattern of lots of very good stuff happening locally. Um, but a continuing question for us, I think, about the extent to which that's genuinely being coordinated and driven um, to ensure that it's it's being delivered um, with pace and at scale. I, I didn't count exactly, but I think in the, in the session you had earlier, I, I think I heard reference to eight, nine, ten maybe different initiatives. Um, all of which I'm sure are doing very good things, um, but it is striking that there are so many different initiatives in roughly the same area in, of, of um, you know, service delivery being delivered right across the country. Now, I'm not at all advocating a one-size-fits-all and everything should be rolled out centrally. That's not what, what our report was about. But I do think there is still something about the way in which we are learning lessons and ensuring that the things do seem to work are actually then delivered uh, more widely. Clear. So one of the, the major issues we've been highlighting over the last couple of years around the delivery plan is the the, the, the great consensus around the overall policy vision. That's, that's a good thing in Scotland. Um, what we don't see, though, is the connection between that overall vision and how that will be implemented, how realisable it is, if you like. Um, so we made recommendations in our most recent NHS overview last year that there needed to be something that showed the workings between here and now, and the overall vision. Uh, so there's work underway to develop a financial framework, which essentially will start to, to show the workings of how we get from here and now to achieve that vision of more people cared for in a, in a homely setting, uh, the right care in the right place at the right time. Um, and we think that's not just important in terms of accountability, although that, that really is important. It's important for the system to understand the steps and the stages that they need to work through to start to realise that change. Uh, because we're acutely aware that there's so much pressure around some of the um, the acute needs within the system. So, you know, we look a lot at e and &E need, about um, delayed discharges, the pressure around GP services and the like, that that can take up so much attention and so much resource that this framework that will start to show the stages people need to work through should hopefully start to move us a little bit away from, from just focusing on, on, on more of the crisis that's facing some of the system, uh, as it can feel on the front line, I'm sure. And uh, <clears throat> do you have a sense of whether the, there is a pace of change where change is happening? Because clearly us. Fraser McKinley described there are some very good initiatives, some very good developments, but uh, uh, is there a sense that things are happening quickly enough? So I, I would say that in some local areas, we absolutely see people grasping this uh, and, and running with it and starting to make some real inroads into, into local services. I would say what we see in a lot of places, though, are, are still people getting tied up in debates and discussions about whose resource it is, where it should be best spent, um, how the governance arrangements are going to work. Uh, and I think key for us has been areas where we see people putting the time and attention in to getting those building blocks in place so they can then start to really focus on improving outcomes, which is what all of this change around integration is was really meant to achieve. We see too many parts of Scotland that are still tied up in some of the mechanics around it, I would say, rather than actually focusing on the what is this about to deliver for people locally. And I think just briefly, convener, I think building on the, the work of the committee last year around integration, the report that we'll publish later this year will put in as a better place, I think, to answer that very specific question. I think that's, in a sense, what we're trying to get at. That's the second of three that we've committed to, um, and this one really is beginning to get a sense of, well, where are we, and are we as, are we as well advanced as you would expect? Thank you very much. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. And thanks, sir, coming along to talk to us this morning. Um, yeah, very interested in what you had to say about um, the financial framework getting set up and also talking about specific local areas where you see there is progress being made. I suppose I'd just like to drill down into that a wee bit further. In the areas that are most advanced in implementation, um, do we start to see measurable results and in terms of improved outcomes, but also in terms of what the big prize is, which is... Um, more effective um, financial performance in the secondary sector? 
So we will be able to give a very clear story about that when we publish our second in the series of work around integration. But we've been keeping a very close eye on this over many, many years, um, that shift of, of, of caring for people more in the community. Uh, and truth be told, pace is not quick enough. Uh, we've highlighted that in a number of reports. Um, I would say the, the early signs of impact for integration that, that, that I've seen have been twofold, where it's worked. It's On one hand, it has been around demonstrable and measurable change but on a small small ish scale around things like reducing delayed discharge about um, better responding to, to people's needs what really matters to them locally um, so that's one that's one way that integration it was starting to see some signs of change but I would say the second way and um, potentially a bit more hidden a bit less visible to people uh, are the changes about how the health and social care system works together. Um, I think what integration is starting to do is to surface some legacy issues around how the health system and local authorities particularly have worked together in the past. So it's starting to shake some of that up and address some, some issues that have held things back for a long time. Now, the jury's out, I guess, in terms of the extent to which that will lead to a real big and systemic change. But we are starting to see people have difficult conversations in some areas that you could argue have not been had in the past, which has got to be a good thing. Um, I, I was very conscious in the in the previous session about the mention of education services and also about housing services and the, the question about the extent to which that they're starting to become involved in, in issues, health and social care integration. So those are some of the things that we'll be looking at and testing out a bit more fully in this second piece of work, but certainly some emerging signs coming through for us. Okay, good. And, and I think just briefly to add, Mr Mickey, I think there's something for me about us trying to unpick the extent to which where we can see real successes, delayed discharges in some places being an obvious example, the extent to which that, that is as a result of integrating health and social care in the way that we have, and or the extent to which that is as a result of really good people just working together locally. So, you know, to what extent is the change of the system and the change of structure actually helping drive that change, and to what extent are some of these things things that we might have seen anyway? So I think there's a kind of there's a bit of a cause and effect there thing that will that will try and tease out. And are you comfortable that there's a good process then for taking best practice where we are learning things and figuring out how to apply that so across the piece? We've made the point before that there is scope to do better around mm. that, absolutely. There's a need to learn from what's working well and think about what is transferable. Now we accept that it's not a case of saying one size fits all, if it's working in Fife, it can work in Glasgow, but we think more care and attention could be paid to thinking about what are the things that make it a success and what can you transfer, so there's more to do there. Okay, thank you very much. Sandra Hart. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, convener. Just to follow on from what I really said, I, I was looking at the, 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 you know, the vision and the, the workforce and the, the delivery plans, and one of the second recommendations that came forward was about investment. Uh, and when you look at the actual amount of investment that's been put in, and I think you raised the figure, uh, Fraser, at the very, very beginning, uh, and we're talking about investment, health fund funding into social care, um, discharge, primary care fund, integrated care fund, and uh, enabled care as well. And if my addition is arithmetic is correct, we're looking at £765 million, pounds, which has been transferred over and, and I hear what you say about the difficulties of uh, health and social care and local authorities working together and I think we're all pretty aware of that unfortunately I, I just wonder with that amount of money has been transferred over to both uh, these in, in the budget uh, do you think that the setting of the budgets from health boards local authorities social care do you think it's um and integrated authorities, uh, uh, authorities as well. Do you think that's in place sufficiently? Uh, is that being monitored as well to ensure that, as I say, £765 million, pounds, is that being monitored is it in place enough to deliver in 2020 with the plan? So I, th I think that's one of the things that the financial framework work is designed to help with. Um, I think I would also say that, I think you said in your own report last year that the the budget setting process locally still feels like it's it's more difficult than it needs to be. Um, we know the issues of timing between health boards and councils, and that's been a difficult process. And it, and it comes to Claire's point earlier about up until this point, people still being very focused on some governance and budget issues, as important as they are. But I think that taking precedence instead of actually asking ourselves the question, well, 
well, what can that money deliver? I also think, and I know this is an easy thing for me to say, but I also think there's a kind of mindset thing here because I think a lot of the discussion and a lot of the debate that we see happening locally, particularly between NHS boards and councils and integration joint boards, is how are we managing the reduction? How are we managing the 5, 10, 15% cut in our budget? Different approaches to that across the country. What we see less of is how are we spending the whatever it is, 700, 600 million pounds uh, locally to deliver um, out the, you know, the best outcomes for our community. So, as I say, I know that's easy for me to say um, uh, from an audit perspective, but, but I think that's the kind of shift now we need to see now that these things are kind of you know, up and running and the governance systems are in place. Um, sorry, I, give you, I just uh, wonder, obviously Audit Scotland will be looking at that and you mentioned the report. Do you think it's something that the Health Committee should perhaps be uh, continuing on in that particular aspect of the budget? Because, I mean, £765 million pounds is a lot of money. Uh, and obviously we want to know where it's going, but has it been spent in the right way? We are, we are all for more parliamentary scrutiny of budgets. Um, so so any, any more of that, that that you want to contribute to would be very welcome from us. I think we have a, we'll continue to bang the drum around clarity and transparency. We've had, uh, as, as well as the NHS overview report that Claire mentioned every year, the Commission, the Accounts Commission produces local government overviews. And and trying to figure out how the money works now between local government, health and everything else is really quite complicated because there are an increasing number of these pots of money that are designed for very specific purposes. In some cases, put into a budget line over here for use in a different sector over here. So, so we'll continue to, um, to try and bring some transparency to that and absolutely anything this committee and other parliamentary committees can do to keep, to keep a watching brief on that would be very welcome from our perspective. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very Brian much. Whittle. Thank you, Kimina. I think... Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. My apologies, Brian. Uh, Claire Sweeney had some additional points. Thank to you. Make. I was just going to mention that that also speaks to our, the point we've been making for a number of years about the need for long-term planning. Um, so we find it quite difficult, for sometimes for good reason, to be able to identify the money that's spent on more preventative interventions, and you heard a lot about that this morning. Um, part of the challenge, I think, is that you, you, are, you are looking at investment, sometimes quite small scale, but the payoff might not be happening for a number of years. That can be really difficult in a partnership context, particularly particularly if people are planning their budgets year on year on year, you're not thinking about the impact 10 years down the line and you've got a lot of pressure in other parts of the system, so that can make it really, really difficult. So as Chris has said, it is about that shift in, in focus that we need to see locally to start to be a little bit more ambitious and think differently. That's incredibly hard to do given the pressures on the system, I would say. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Kavina. I think um, in, in the earlier panel session, it was very helpfully pointed out that most of us will end up uh, requiring some sort of uh, intervention in the social care market, um, some of us sooner rather than later. But um, I wanted to talk specifically about uh, the, the care of the elderly in, in the care homes and the, and the very welcome introduction of, of the living wage is not necessarily being mitigated uh, against, uh, and that in those in that service, costs and, and, and income and staffing levels uh, are mostly imposed, so they have very little flex. And, and how they uh, how they can uh, run the uh, run their system and a big, the big cost is in, is in staffing. So, with with that in mind, I mean, is there evidence there that, that there's a strain being put in that system that that, that, that it potentially unsustainable? Yes, and I think you, you you heard a lot of that in the evidence the earlier evidence session and also in the submissions, um, and that that absolutely mirrors some of the messages that we've we've said in a, in, a, in a number of previous reports, particularly the report Fraser mentioned around social work services in Scotland, where we we explicitly said that the way that services are provided currently is not sustainable. Um, that was talking about social care in the round, but has things to say about um, residential care homes in particular. The challenges we drew out in that report, they still remain valid, are pressures around the funding model, uh, about ability to secure a uh, workforce and the value that's placed on them. And I would say there is a, there's a the real push and a real challenge around people seeing that sector as, as um, something that they want to work in, that children want to be trained in and go through higher education and then become employed in the, in the care sector. That's really difficult. Uh, and not to forget that it also actually employs an awful lot of nursing staff as well. So it's not it's not just the, the, the social work side of things, the social care side of things. It employs a lot of nursing staff too. So I think some real challenges in, in securing a, a, the workforce uh, fit to deal with um, often people who need an awful lot of um, 
health and social care support. So that those challenges highlighted in that report still remain. Mm. If, if I could convene, to, you know, I think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the way that um, uh, the care homes have developed, you know, not that many decades ago, it, the, the, there, were, there was that whole idea around being a granny farm almost, right up to nowadays. It's the, you know, the people are going into care homes much later in life, uh, and a lot more, you know, specialist care is required, as you've mentioned around uh, nurses. Are we adapting quickly enough to that to that change in model? So there's no doubt that it's a different model now than it was before. Um, you heard in the, in the previous session about the way that GP workload and interact, the way they need to interact with patients has changed significantly over the next, the last, say, five, ten years. We are looking at a very different system now, and again, that's why we thought it was so important to have something that showed how you achieve the overall vision of caring for people in the right place at the right time with the resources that are available in a system that has changed beyond all recognition in the last ten years. Uh, the needs of people in care homes now compared to where they were before is very different so we might have talked quite a lot a few years back about um, the ability to stop people going into residential care homes because they were defaulting there and actually they could be cared for at home, accepting that some of the packages that needed to be in place to keep people in their own home were quite significant. Um, and there have been programmes to recognise the support that's needed for unpaid carers. So if you have a relative and you want to keep them at home, the support that you need to help you in your care and duties um, has increased a lot over the last few years but I think we, we we still would have the question about to what extent everybody has recognised the way that resources need to be used differently in that context so what it is to run a care home now is, ve is a very very different ask than it was say even five years ago um, and have the funding models changed to reflect that um, I, I think there's a legitimate question you saw some of those concerns and risks coming through in the evidence session and we would have them too. Alice Cohen. Thank you. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I think one of the obvious problems to the changing demographic in our care home needs in respect of the future um, is the, the sort of lack of capacity that exists in the in this sector. Certainly in Edinburgh, we are 600 fewer beds, care home, residential care home beds, than we probably require now, and a country mile behind where we'll need to be in 20 years' time. Um, but one of the barriers to this is the tension that exists with planning, and that oftentimes um, big, particularly big build residential care homes bring in objections, particularly when developers aren't considering the needs of overstretched local health services and what they're going to the demands that are going to be impacted upon that um, and indeed the concerns of local residents about the change of character within the area is there anything we need to do through planning law to make a life easier um, both on communities and uh, planners in terms of where we site residential care homes or have we got the balance right is an excellent question, and I'm not sure I have the answer for it, unfortunately. But what I think what it has got me thinking about, though, is the, obviously the planning bills going through uh, stages at the moment. The local government committee uh, has asked for views on that, so that's going to be something I'll, I'll go away and have a look at with with that in mind, um, uh, and and the extent to which planning as a barrier is clearly something you might want to look at in a world of being joined up. I think the, an additional question for me is is just thinking about what kind of service provision and therefore what kind of, you know, to use the auditor term, assets we need to deliver it. So what do we need in terms of buildings? Is it big care homes? Is it sheltered housing? Is it, you know, what what is it that we need? I was very struck um, by uh, one of the contributors earlier talking about the increased need for observed care, I think he called it, increasing incidences of dementia. Uh, and, and I think what's interesting is that this is a, this is very much a moving feast and I think we need to keep checking our assumptions because I think if the principle of the policy is that we we shift the balance of care away from institutions to care at home or in a homely setting, I guess you would assume that you might therefore need fewer care home beds. Well, actually, at the moment, that doesn't feel like where we are. And if actually um, where people are right about what's happening with things like dementia, I'm not sure that necessarily falls into the future, which comes back to our challenge around long-term planning, both in terms of uh, finances, workforce, buildings, looking 10 years ahead, what are we going to need for this? And clearly, if things like planning are, are one of the things that makes that more difficult, then, then you'd want to look at it as part of that whole system review. And one, one of the other things worth bearing in mind is that the, the, 
the need for local areas to um, to help to develop a market. And we've uh, reported before in a, in, a, in, a, in a few years ago on a report around commissioning health and social care services about um, the degree to which local areas are facilitating and developing a market. Um, we know that a lot of services are provided by the private sector and um, by voluntary sector services. Um, so we're very interested in the degree to which um, the NHS boards and the local authorities are working constructively with, with both those sectors to make sure that the services in place locally are, are fit for purpose. Uh, and we absolutely recognise that in some parts of Scotland, the, the challenge around the expensiveness of, of land, particularly in the central belt, is a major feature in, in, and has a huge impact in, in the capacity around things like the care home sector, but it's not just residential care homes we're talking about there. So there's a whole range of different um, different features across Scotland that impact on the health of the, of the services that are available locally. Thank you very much. Uh, David Stewart. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Um, can I ask uh, your view on the Improvement Hub, the so-called iHub, which, as you know, was set up nearly two years ago uh, by um, the uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland? Um, I watched their online presentation last night. I perhaps need to get out a bit more often. Um, but it certainly was an excellent uh, uh, analysis of the work they have done. But what assessment have you made about the effectiveness of the IHAB's leadership and speed of manoeuvrability to affect the changes that are needed? So we've had, we have absolutely commented on this in previous reports about the importance of having an improvement focus and about giving the space for areas to to learn and develop the um, the the improvement approaches that fit them well locally. That's absolutely essential. We're really interested in the extent to which um, NHS boards, in this instance, predominantly, but not alone, the IJBs working with local authorities, are able to invest in that kind of central support. Um, it's essential that they have that. Um, um, what we've seen when that's developed really well, though, is that it's not necessarily just a central team that makes that work. Um, there are tools and techniques and the learning that needs to happen, so boards need support to get that embedded locally. Uh, but what's really important is that that happens at a critical mass in the local area. So we know that there is a focus on that nationally, that improvement focus. We think that needs to, that needs to develop even further. Um, we've not looked in great detail in terms of the resource ask around that, but it's certainly something we'll bear in mind in our second review of, of um, integration authorities. We think it's an important part of what can help to make this work. So in your general assessment, sorry for I cut you off no, the bit, in your general assessment, um, you take account of the effectiveness of IHAB. Is two years, nearly two years, long enough for you to assess how effective they are? So the short answer to the question is we haven't really done that specifically. So we haven't looked at the effectiveness of IHAB, of IHAB specifically and, um, and the extent to which two years is long enough, I guess, would be a bit of a judgment call. I think I think for me it's one of those things that you would you would rather have it than not. I think anything that helps uh, share good practice and, and is a place to which people can go to learn has to be a good thing and, and we can we can pick that up as, as our wider work. I think as part of our wider work. I think the wider point I would make is that um it does strike me that we are still guilty of looking at health problems from a health perspective still. And and our system is designed um, and indeed, I think some of the conversation this morning um, kind of came from quite a health perspective. I was struck at how little councils were mentioned, for example. I know there was mention of working in leisure centres and other places, but it does seem to me that if the general consensus, as it seems to be, is that issues of inequality and deprivation are central to this, then improvement resource needs to be about a joined up response to that rather than, um, or possibly as well as, specifically health related interventions it does seem to me that we are still well we we have the analysis of the issue nailed i think in terms of what the issue is and you heard from sir harry burns uh, not long ago and he's been saying this for a really very long time it still feels like our systems um, of accountability and improvement are still struggling to catch up with that and i think that has to be part of the shift over the next while careful to you convener we have to be careful then not to be in a health silo but you're really saying this is about poverty and inequality this is that these are the big issues yeah and, and it's not and, and i'm by no means an expert in this so you had the experts in earlier but my sense is it's not an either or of course there are going to be things that you can do in terms of the, the delivery of the health intervention that could be better in your learn lessons it also seems to me that we need to be better at joining up our approaches uh, and learning the lessons of of community engagement 
Uh, a lot of the great stuff we heard from McMillan earlier today seems to me that I'm fascinated by the wee example of um, an NHS board in the south of Scotland working with the, the National Farmers Union locally. Th those kinds of things seems to me the kind of innovative work that we need to be seeing happening um, kind of everywhere, really. There's just one example, Ingo, on the health stats today. Um, the, the, bow the bowel um, screening figures for disadvantaged areas are quite disappointing, and that was, I think, mirrors what we were discussing earlier about disadvantaged areas and problem with health. Thank you very much. Miles Briggs. Thank you. I wanted to um, <clears throat> pick up on a point Alex Cole Hamilton raised with regards to future provision, and um, really to see to what extent, and this goes back to local authorities, which you mentioned, is there a disconnect between what we will need, and we know we'll need, and actually what we're now planning towards? And I know um, Jones Lang, uh, Jones Lang um, McSale did a re report on this specifically recently, saying that in 2018, Scotland will be 3,000 um, care home beds short. But actually, to meet the future demand, um, there's about 10,800 they predict we'll need on top of the capacity by 2028. In terms of your work, do you think we're getting anywhere near actually meeting what people are saying we're needing? And, and why is that not being reached? Is it within the Scottish Government or within local authorities? And where's the disconnect um, to actually realise that in the future? So there, there is work now uh, with the introduction of IJBs to look more closely at local need and think about projections over the longer term. So that's absolutely something we intend to look at as part of this second piece of work. Again, back to the, the, the two reports we're talking about today, particularly um, the Social Work in Scotland report. Um, we've said that, that that's not been in place in the past. Um, we recognise that that can be challenging because we are talking about um, a different level of demand, as we've already spoken about, the, the makeup of the people People in care homes particularly is different now, their needs are different. Um, the challenges around securing a workforce are different, so things like Brexit have a potential impact there also. Um, so there is a need to look very closely at future demand, um, and back to the point we made earlier about the need for longer term planning around that. The financial framework we talked about should, should help to a degree with some of that, um, connecting up the policy vision with how that will actually be delivered on the ground, with a sense of the stages that need to be gone through by all parties involved to achieve that. So the simple answer I guess is we're not quite there yet and there's more work to do. I mean I, mean, I think you would, you would argue that the, the creation of integration authorities is designed to do exactly that kind of thing so um, that's why I think it's important as we've already said that uh, it, IGBs in particular are now able to get beyond issues of governance and setting themselves up as new organisations into exactly that kind of discussion about what the local need is and therefore what kind of service delivery um, or, and what kind of service model is, is required in future. Of course, this, there is a bit of crystal ball gazing in all of this, and, and that's why scenario planning is important. Um, and that's why I think ensuring that the focus is on people, uh, an assessment of people being able to access the care they need in the most appropriate setting is key. Um, and, and that's always a difficult judgment, and the people based locally are the best people to make those kind of judgments. I just have a quick follow-up. One, one of the things which we've heard in different pieces of work is actually what's destabilising the current provision we have. And a number of aspects of that from the Scottish Carers Living Age not necessarily being properly funded to actually just cities being more expensive. Like the, um, the city Alex Cole Hamilton and I represent of Edinburgh and Aberdeen. Actually, the, the living wage isn't going to necessarily attract people into the sector. So I just wondered if you had any comments on that talked a lot about that in a, in a previous report on commissioning social care and um, that challenge in making the work making the work attractive um, the profile of it in, of it in Scotland um, the numbers of people that when we project forward that it looks like we will need people to go into those services in far greater numbers than are, than are possibly available at the moment so so yes there was, there was absolutely something there about um, affordability attractiveness of that as that of a, as a profession to go into um, and we know that there have been examples Examples of work to try and shift that um, but the underlying issue is of course one of resources about how much is paid for those services and how the funding works around them um, so the challenges will be different across Scotland but there are some things that are absolutely common pressures another strand of our work recently you'll be aware of is the work that we're doing around workforce specifically we published uh, a report last year on the acute um, bit of the system and we're beginning to work on a on a sister piece of work around uh, primary and community-based care, building on the work that government and COSLA have done at the end of last year about a 
the beginnings of a workforce strategy for that sector. And we think for exactly those reasons, that's why that's really important. I was struck by some of the responses you got to the care home um, inquiry before Christmas that, that, you know, on one level, absolutely, you can argue that paying the living wage is a good thing, full stop. Um, beyond that, I was interested to read some responses saying that in terms of it being able to ease the recruitment difficulties that some areas are having, it doesn't seem to be working. Um, so again, you're, you know, you've, you've increased your cost base in simple terms without any real um, benefit beyond the fact that it's a good thing to do and these people will, you know, will feel more valued and all the things that come with that. But in terms of actually helping ease some of the pressures that some uh, uh, services are facing, um, I think we'll need to wait and see. Emma Harper. Um, in the document that we have, it talks about the recommendations from the Change in Models of Health and Social Care report, and it says that one of the recommendations is to ensure that new models of care um, here and abroad, that work is shared, and, and that was one of the recommendations. And I'm aware of you know, the two projects in Dumfries and Galloway, which have been promoted by the IGB, which is, seem to be functioning quite well, actually. There's the CoSync project which has seen community groups invited to tender for delivery of two health and wellbeing centres in the region. And there's another project, which is 8.7 million of European money funded it, called the Empower Project, and that's to look at over 65s with long-term conditions. So they have to pilot these studies first, figure out if they work, and then audit them, obviously, and then share them. So that obviously takes time. So, But I think... Um, my point is that all of this is just the process takes a long time to evidence what works and then how do we shift it and change it. So what would be the recommendations for moving things along? So we, we've spoken quite a lot about this in, in some of our previous work. Um, we recognise that things are, you, you can't have one size fits all for Scotland. Certain things that work in a certain area will not work in other places. We absolutely get that um, people need to be involved in how those services are changing. So the importance of involving communities in the thing that works best for them. Uh, we've talked a lot about things like self-directed support, um, where people will have um, a much more even and and shared uh, focus with healthcare professionals and with social work professionals in determining what, what's right for them, uh, which will be very different person to person, let alone from IJB to IJB area. So there's a whole lot of issues there that mean the care that one person gets in one area might be very, very different from another another part of Scotland. Um, none of this makes it very, very easy to audit. <laughs> Not that that's the purpose for, for having the services in the first place. Uh, but we do need to take account of the fact that people will want different things in different areas. So I think that's, that's absolutely right and that's fine. I think where we would shine a bit of a light is to see that if there are things that work really well, if there are things that um, are success factors or principles that can be applied to other areas, that they need to share that, they need to learn from that across the whole of Scotland and need to, to move on it. Um, it's absolutely right that the improvement focuses on um, support in local areas to, to work out what needs to change and to get the right solution for the local area with the staff involved and with the people who receive the care. That's all, that's all correct. Uh, but there must be something in this about improving how we share good practice and learning across the whole system and I think there is still scope to do that we talked at the start of the session about some of the things that may be getting in the way of that um, and one of those things is no doubt um, discussions about agreeing budgets and a focus on governance and structures when actually leaders within the system should be uh, just as focused if not more focused on what positive impact they're achieving through the changes so yes a need to have a greater focus on learning and improving things as we go uh, one of the other things I would mention that we've, we've seen over the years is um, a lack of um, evaluation. So it's really important that uh, the work goes in to make sure that projects that are piloted are evaluated properly and then the lessons are shared. If that's not happened right at the start of setting up a new project, then you're going to really struggle to, to prove what, what difference it makes and argue for the resources to be put against that. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Ashton. Thank you, Convener. Um, I just want to pick up on the area that Emma Harper has um, started to speak about, which is this changing models of care and, and models um, that we might move to into the future. So in your opening statement, you mentioned 
that there are new models that are happening, but they're quite sc small scale at the moment and they're limited to you know, certain parts of Scotland. So I'm wondering if you could just give an, ex an example of that type of thing and then whether you think they might be scalable across Scotland or even whether that would be desirable. Um, so I think the, the work we did on changing models of health and social care, we actually produced a, a whole supplement which, which listed a whole range of individual kind of case studies. There's uh, 12, of, 12 different areas we looked at, um, some in places like Forfar, some in international approaches, Canterbury uh, is one that's often cited. And I think, um, and I think in a sense, that's the, that's the point we're making in this report and we continue to make, which is th there are good things happening in every part of the country. So it's not like there are you know black spots of a lack of innovation. I think there are good things happening everywhere. And, and maybe that's okay, M maybe the, the approach here is let a thousand flowers bloom and, and it's, a, it's all about local and, and that's going to be the thing that's going to make the difference. I think what we would observe is at the moment it doesn't feel like that's the case. It doesn't feel like the things that we're already doing are going to have the kind of impact at scale that is required to meet the challenge of the system as we, as we understand it and as we've heard all about today with uh, the demographic changes and the financial situation and everything else. So... I mean, what was interesting about that process is that we went and had a look at some things and we thought, well, these look quite interesting and quite good. And then there was a big debate about whether they are actually very good and the extent to which you can roll them out. And and we were very specifically not saying that you can just take something that's happening in Forfar and apply it to Glasgow. What we do think you can do is identify the characteristics of the thing that made it successful in Forfar and think about how you would apply those characteristics in Glasgow. Now, that I'm not su suggesting that never happens, but it does seem to us that it's not happening enough at scale to meet the challenges that, that we know the system is facing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Jenny Goldruth. Um, with regard to the integration uh, in terms of how it's working in terms of culturally between social work, the health boards and integration authorities, there does seem to be an imbalance. And Social Work Scotland highlight that integration has created complex governance arrangements. Are cultural issues therefore impeding the progress moving forward? So, so the short answer would be to say we'll come back in November and December and, and, and let you know, but we'll, be, we'll try and be more helpful for that. I think in the, in the last report we did, the first report we did on integration, we recognise the complexity of the landscape now. And certainly if you're working in it, then it does feel very complex. And indeed, if you're receiving services, my sense is that, that people aren't, are probably pretty unaware of how it all of how it all works. Um, so there is a, a degree of complexity and that doesn't mean that it can't work. Um, and you know we have integration joint boards and people are genuinely committed, I think, to making that process work. I think we have seen cultural differences between um, councils and health boards. I think just the coming together of councillors and NHS board members on the integrated joint boards has been uh, a process that they've all had to work through, as well as some of the um, different cultures that you experience on the ground. My sense is that, you know, again, in lots of places, people in social work and health boards are have been used to working together for a long time. So this is not this is not brand new. I think the challenge for us is about how are we really making the step change? If if integration joint boards are accountable for about eight billion pounds worth of public spend, then we should begin to see ways in which that spend is being done differently. How is the integration of health and social care making a genuine difference to how that significant public resource is being used? And I think that's the big test for us that, that we'll be trying to trying to test through this year. Yeah. And, and, and I think um, a couple of things we've, we've observed as we've been kind of keeping quite a close eye on how integration has been progressing since we published our report in 2015. And I'd probably say two things coming through for me. Um, a set of challenges around some technical issues that need to be resolved, no doubt about it. There were still some technical things that are to be worked through. But I would say that, that that's much, much smaller than the, the bigger issue um, about the, the the cultures coming together, as you say, and the need to for leaders within the system to say, yes, there may be a few technical issues we need to work through, but actually we're all committed to that outcome, the improving outcomes for local people, using our resources collectively to think about how we best use that to improve services for folk um, in our local area is absolutely possible. Um, and that's what we would expect leaders to be focused in and around. So for, for the audit perspective, we would expect to see the governance arrangements set out very clearly 
clearly so we can understand that, so local people can understand that. Yeah. But the most important thing is about achieving those outcomes. So on that point, that local people point, um, do you think overly complex governance arrangements are actually detrimental in terms of greater transparency? They put people off because nobody understands how these systems work and are talking to each other. And actually, the organisation as a whole becomes far less accountable than it perhaps previously might have been. So there is absolutely a, a need for that to be understandable for people, not just auditors, but absolutely for local people to understand. It's important that people who are managing and running the system understand that, because we know in some places they don't. Um, so there absolutely is a need for people to be clear about what they're accountable for, who's responsible for delivering the services that they receive. Absolutely, that's true. Um, but we would say that over and above that, um, people need to be focused on improving outcomes. And if the whole debate is taken up with governance challenges, challenges around funding, then that's a missed opportunity, I would say. Okay, thank I think you. the only thing I would add to the convener is that, so I think, I think my answer to that question about um, the extent to which people, ordinary folk, understand the governance of it is kind of yes and no. So in principle, yes, of course, it's important that people understand how all this works. I think what's probably more important is that people are genuinely engaged and involved in a discussion locally about how health and care services are delivered for them. I'm not sure if you're going to your GP or trying to get a, a care package in place, you're, you're necessarily that concerned about the governance structure at this level. We will be, always, because I think that's really important in terms of accountability. But what really does need to happen, and again, I think some of the work of the committee said this, is that integration joint boards with partners need to be much better at engaging communities in a discussion, a meaningful discussion about how you design services locally. And at the moment, that's patchy, I think, at best. Thank you. Okay. Can I say thank you very much to our witnesses? That's been very helpful. And we will uh, suspend briefly uh, to allow a change of witnesses. Thank you very much. resume our meeting of the committee. Uh <laughs> our next session is to take evidence again on the uh, item of care home sustainability and uh, I welcome to the committee 
the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, Shona Robinson, and uh, Jeff Huggins, Director of Health, Health and Social Care Integration. Minister, I believe you want to uh, open with a statement. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, I welcome the committee's interest in care home sustainability, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to respond to some of your, your questions. Uh, at the outset, I want to emphasise that in seeking to promote sustainability, we need to see residential care in the context of the wider health and care system, whether it be care at home or, or care in hospital. Our vision uh, is to enable people to live independently at home or in a homely setting for as long as possible. A sustainable residential care sector will play a, a key role in helping us achieve this vision, but in partnership with the wider health and care system. There is and will continue to be an important place for residential care and care homes in Scotland. However, they will have a different emphasis in the future, whether it be through delivering a higher proportion of intermediate care, providing specialist care to people with dementia or with neurological conditions or for end of life care. The role of a care home is already evolving to better meet uh, people's needs. Some of the challenges facing the sector were highlighted by stakeholders as part of your earlier evidence session. They included recruitment and retention of staff, uh, including nursing staff, lack of care home availability in some areas and instability in the market. Addressing these challenges has required a change in the way we currently approach social care to ensure sustainability going forward. Following the same models of care and support simply on a bigger scale or paying more for less will not allow us to create something that is sustainable for the future, nor will it ensure we can deliver high quality, flexible services that move away from time and task and have people's choice, control and independence at their heart. Much of this is about redesigning services in a whole system way, using existing resources more effectively to improve quality. And that's why we've integrated health and social care, which has opened up opportunities to develop different models of care, which reflect the, the changing needs of localities. At the committee, uh, as the committee has been uh, made away through this process, a number of integration authorities are beginning to make this shift and develop plans to support an efficient, effective, diverse and sustainable market for high quality care. And because of uh, this, the role of care homes is evolving to better meet the needs of people. In some places, care homes are being used to provide intermediate care for patients who require it on discharge from hospital or to prevent hospital admission. Fife Integration Authority is one example. They've commissioned intermediate care beds where short-term rehabilitation is provided with a view to returning people to their homes when they're ready. Significant progress has been made around work to address the workforce challenges, for example, around sustaining registered nursing workforce within uh, care homes in several areas. Integrated authorities are taking a cluster approach by working flexibly with care homes to ensure registered nursing input is available to residents. And in some localities, for example, in East Lothian, NHS staff are regularly used to staff care homes. Such cluster approaches are also being seen in the training and upskilling of care home staff and I know that Dumfries and Galloway is currently working with Scottish Care to look at piloting uh, work to support our care homes in the area uh, from an enhanced education and support role, particularly with some of their specialist nurse and advanced nurse practitioner work. In palliative care, Highland Hospice is using a tool and approach for mentoring to support community palliative care across the region in a range of settings, including care homes. Currently, staff in 20 care homes across Highland are benefiting from the approach. The National Care Home Contract is and has been a good foundation for care home sustainability over the last 10 years. Through this process, we've seen year-on-year -year uplifts, which have not been mirrored in the rest of the UK or in other sectors. Over the last three years, funding through the National Care Home Contract has increased by 13.2% from £609.31 to £667.09 per place per week. But we recognise that there's more to do to ensure long-term sustainability as well as enable local commissioners to redesign and commission services based on local population needs. That's why the National Care Home Contract reform process is currently underway. Part of this involves working with providers to co-produce a shared, transparent understanding of what it takes to provide a care home place through the development of a cost of care calculator. Alongside this, uh, work is being done to enable variation in the contract in order to respond to different models of care. Our approach to setting a national rate and our work with providers to reform the approach was recently praised by the Competition and Markets Authority in their Care Home Market Study. 
Going forward, we're building a programme of reform for adult social care, which allows us to look at what residential care should look like in the future. So, in conclusion, our approach to ensuring sustainability demands that we move beyond the short-term fix to think about longer-term sustainability. It needs all parties to work together to make that happen. We're committed to doing this through integration, through working with partners to improve our national care home contract, through our reform of adult social care, and through the actions in the National Workforce Plan published uh, back uh, the second part of which was published back in December. So I welcome the opportunity to discuss this with the committee in more detail. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And, and as you rightly say, this issue stands in the wider context of integration of health and social care. And we've heard this morning from Audit Scotland on some of the aspects of that which have a bearing on care home sustainability. One of the things that I think came through strongly from their evidence was that although there is, as you described, some very good practice in particular parts of the country. Uh, there is, an, I think they, they, they put it as a need to share learning uh, much better uh, and ensure that we're not simply having uh, good local initiatives, but actually joining those up. What, what's your uh, take on that and how far do you believe the health and social care delivery plan addresses that? Yes, uh, that, that is critical. Um, I'm a firm believer in uh, what work should be spread and best practice should be spread. I suppose the caveat to that is that what might work in a remote and rural area might have to be a bit different from an, an urban setting just in terms of, in terms of the availability of workforce. Um, and there are particular market conditions. I mean, if you look at the city of Edinburgh and Lothian, there are particular challenges uh, here that are not necessarily the same for in Glasgow, for example. So, so um, yes, in in uh, absolutely, I think there there is the need to share best practice. We have the improvement uh, work that's ongoing um, that Jeff can speak about more to to help do that. And uh, nobody should be uh, immune for asking for for support in in terms of improvement. No one has all the answers, but there, without doubt, is good practice that would be good to, to share more widely. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the important thing to recognise in this is that what we're seeing is across the country how systems of care are evolving. Um, you know, when we look at an area you know, like the area we're in, you know, City of Edinburgh, and we think of all the different components that go into providing older people services, um, you know, we, we, draw, we draw a diagram which has got about 47 different boxes, including hospital, care at home, respite, support for carers, all of which you know, are a system of care. And, and quite often we focus on one of the components of that rather than seeing the whole story. Uh, one of the interesting conversations for us at the moment is, is as you begin to think about the evolution and the, the development of residential care into more step up, step down, palliative end of life, maybe some of the people who may historically would have been in continuing um, care in NHS facilities, you're beginning to describe what in rural areas you might see within a community hospital. Um, and in other areas, you might also begin to see things which are in which are in hubs. So, what, what the, there's probably some general functions or principles, but the the construction of how you put the system together is probably going to be quite different from area to area. The um, what, one of the most interesting things in the first couple of years of integration has been how housing, which is not a fully integrated service, has been one of the areas which has probably seen the most evolution in terms of housing um, uh, su supported housing solutions in a number of areas. Um, and again, you're, you're beginning to see how that, but you know, that's something which you can probably do within some property markets and not within other property markets. So it's, it's the adaptability, but the learning. Um, we, we tend to talk about it as a sort of conscious localism. You know, you should know the evidence base, you should know what everybody else is doing, and you should find the best solution from your area. And you know, that includes learning. Thank you very much. Miles Briggs. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be perhaps aware that this morning it was announced that Renaissance Care is to close its home um, in Musselburgh. And part of um, the, the rationale behind that was factors which are destabilising the sector. And I printed off um, their chairman, Robert Kilgour's statement on this. And specifically, he, he raises the apprenticeship levy and what's not been put in place in Scotland. And just to quote him directly, he says here, we're currently, we currently get absolutely nothing back from the Scottish government for this jobs tax. They're making it very difficult for the social care sector to claim any credit back from these new extra payments to spend on apprenticeship or training schemes as was intended and as is happening in England. So I just wondered if you had any comment on that specifically. Um, well, first of all, um I think um, we have uh, 
taken an approach, as I set out in my opening remarks, to try to support the sector. Um, we have, as you'll be aware, provided significant resources to um, pay the living wage, for example, to uh, all parts of the sector, including the independent sector. That is uh, something that uh, we felt was important in terms of helping them to recruit and retain uh, staff. Um, and we have uh, significantly increased um, the National Care Home contract, as I set out in my opening remarks. Um, I am aware that for uh, the care home that we were talking about, they had some particular difficulties, not least around the fact, I think, that they didn't have on suite facilities and that they were struggling to meet some of the standards that were required. So I think it's quite a complex picture um, that uh, that care home was, was facing and then the requirement of investment there was obviously a decision uh, that the owners would have to balance in terms of whether or not that is something they wanted to do. I think the apprenticeship levy, is, as I understand, uh, we have, uh, well, obviously that was something that the UK government has decided to, to take forward, that uh, the, uh, we have worked with uh, employers to make sure that um, resources are uh, passed on in terms of what we do here in Scotland. So I don't recognise the scenario that has been painted there regarding the apprenticeship levy. Um, I think there are many issues impacting on the care home sector. That is certainly not one that has been highlighted. The one that has been highlighted mainly to me, not least by Scottish Care, is the impact of the loss of uh, nursing staff through Brexit and the inability of them to be able to recruit uh, nurses into the sector, of which, of course, a large percentage were coming through uh, EU channels and effectively the the door has now closed on those recruitment agencies in Europe and that was Scottish Care themselves telling me that directly so in all of the issues impacting on the care home sector the apprenticeship levy is not one that has been highlighted to me as being a significant issue but I can say that we have made sure that we have translated resources uh, through uh, to, to support employers uh, as we would exp expect and I'm happy to, to write with further detail of that if you'd find that helpful. Maybe to add a, a, a couple of elements to that. So first of all, as the Cabinet Secretary says, the apprenticeship levy is a UK um, um, levy. In terms of the conversations that are going on around the National Care Home contract and the creation of the cost calculator, both the cost of the living wage and the apprenticeship levy are built into that. Mm -hmm. So the, those are understood as costs that apply as part of the process and the apprenticeship levy was certainly considered as one of the items during the last year's negotiations. These are also, of course, um, both policies, living wage and apprenticeship levy, that apply to all care homes. This hasn't been something which has been applied to this particular care home. And, and so there are a wider range of factors which are not purely about the environment with, in which care homes operate that we need to take account of. And, and clearly, other providers and other homes are able to continue to operate effectively within that framework. So I, I think it's, it's, it's quite easy to identify government policy as the reason, but there may also be other reasons that you want to look for. Yeah, can I just, in, in terms of nursing, one of the points which was also raised by Scottish Care um, and some of the evidence we heard, which I thought was interesting, about 6% of the care, home care um, population and workforce um, were EU nationals. But in terms of tra future training, one of the concerns which was expressed was actually a drive towards the government's target of just reaching child carers and training child carers and actually a potential loss of adult carers. Um, do you have any comment on that and, and where you're feeding into that system for our college sector specifically to, to train the people we'll need? So I think um, Scottish Care had identified that nearly 8% of nurses in uh, care homes were uh, EU nationals. So I think um, you, without a doubt that is going to be a, a significant uh, challenge around uh, recruiting uh, 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 in nurses to to the care home sector uh, which is why we are looking at other models uh, we are as I set out in my opening remarks um, some of the solutions to that I think lie in the uh, workforce that uh, potentially is NHS employed um, providing locality based solutions to uh, care homes and nursing homes um, we're 
some of that is already happening in some areas and we're testing that further in Dumfries and Galloway, not just nurses, but AHPs and, and others. Um, and I think there is a longer term solution in that direction of travel rather than, and, and of course, trying to uh, also meantime um, uh, promote the benefits of uh, in a nursing career within a care home environment. But I think we have to also look at those locality-based teams. In terms of your point about uh, childcare, uh, yes, I think there is definitely, although it's a, obviously a good thing, the expanded uh, childcare provision and therefore the expanded workforce, um, there is a, a, a challenge there about that might be the same people who would be attracted, which is why in the part two of the workforce plan uh, published uh, at the end of the year, uh, we were clear that we needed to promote uh, care as a, a career and it set out the campaign that we would be undertaking this year as one element of that. Also looking at uh, very clear career opportunities to progress, for example, onto a re regulated profession such as nursing, uh, so that if you come in as a care worker, you can see a career uh, pathway in front of you that's clear. So all of these things are about making care uh, a more attractive career choice, uh, not just for young people, but for actually people uh, perhaps in other careers and uh, um, in other walks of life. So a lot of that is set out in the workforce plan about how we intend to do that so that we are um, uh, minimising the impact of, of people choosing uh, other choices. I think the other thing to add to that is we're, we're conscious of the challenge and so we're doing some cross-government work with officials in other departments or other parts of the Scottish Government to actually understand the, the dynamics of that. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary says, the second part, the, the part two of the workforce plan also begins to get into using and developing integrated workforce data and better local market um, analysis because as, you know, as we go across the country visiting integration authorities, we hear very different st stories about the availability. And again, it, it does take you into the, the likelihood that you are going to see quite different models of care which are um, developing in the context of different available labour forces, which um, is, you know, is just the reality of, of where we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning. Another thing. <laughs> I often wonder if we have actually even get the words right, care home, residential care. It just doesn't seem right somehow, and I'm, I'm not going to suggest what it should be called, but sometimes that's why it gets what you might call bad press, and staff are uh, obviously not paid the living wage in certain aspects and I pick up on uh, Miles Briggs uh, point there as well and, and uh, obviously the cabinet secretary uh, really you know it should be looked upon as a career because obviously predominantly women uh, low paid so really any uh, care home if that's what we'll call it a provider that can't afford to pay the living wage and uh, the care home contract shouldn't be in the business at all and I'm pleased to see that uh, basically this this will be pushed and obviously promotion into other careers as well and and I touch on that part because I think it's really important that at the moment we're looking at uh, the changing in care uh, and obviously um, residents needs are changing greatly and the nursing uh, care is, is needed too uh, it's greater as well and I, I will touch on the reason that we, we had the investigation at the beginning was because of the situation with the build uh, provision uh, and I would declare an interest in that as a relative of mine uh, had uh, stayed in the build home and, and got excellent care and I could never fault them for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just wonder, uh, having been through that and we know the situation with build small units and mm -hmm. communities which worked uh, beautifully and very, very well, um, what the government is doing to alleviate the situation with these care homes obviously that have closed, uh, citing the fact that they don't have enough monies uh, in, in that respect. Uh, I just wonder what the government is doing to alleviate that and, and what are they putting in, in place of, obviously, the situation within the communities that the build homes are closing? OK. Um, well, our priority has been to ensure the continuity of care for build residents um, and with making sure there's no compromise in the, the quality of care. Now, um, build have um, obviously decided to, I suppose, go back to their, their core business that was more focused on housing with care. It's what they originally did, and they see that as the, the future direction of travel. Um, and they 
had uh, difficulties with the sustainability over a, over a number of years, actually, of their diversification into uh, care, the care home sector. Um, so, Beald are very clear with me that that you know decision um, obviously was a difficult decision, but it was based on um, their their desire to to go back to. Uh, providing what they saw as the future direction of travel of housing with care. What was important then was to make sure that that transition and the continuity of care for build residents um, was the priority. Officials, Jeff has been involved in this very closely, have been meeting with build on a regular basis on, along with the, um, the health and care partnerships that are affected to make sure that um, that, that happens um, and that plans are put in place for residents. And, Good progress uh, has been made um, and there have been a number of um, new providers that are going to take over some of those uh, care establishments and for others um, there has been a, a lot of work put into making sure there is a, a smooth transition because we know there, you know, we want the, the important thing here is minimise the, the impact of that change uh, for vulnerable elderly people. Um, I... Uh, can, I mean, Jeff can maybe talk about the detail of, of, of progress being made there, but uh, I think they certainly are where they wanted to be in terms of the, the March position and then the July position, and I think they've made the progress that they, they needed to make. Perhaps they can have a couple of questions first. Fine, we we'll yeah. and, and then um, we'll get some of the detail then. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, in opening, you spoke about uh, the need for a vision to live independently at home as long as possible and Mr Huggins spoke to about you know looking at the whole story here and um, I think you know we're all aware of the fact that the private rental sector has increased by a third over the last two decades and more people will be aging in private rented accommodation and you know, I, often I think when we're discussing this, we think about adaptations to local authority housing or social sector housing. So I just wondered if there's any discussions um, that the government was having with landlords, for example, because I think involving them in this discussion is really important if we want to lessen future burdens on our care homes, you know, with regards to access for carers and any ad adaptations that are needed out with that social housing model. I, I agree, and uh, yes, and actually it shouldn't matter what the tenure is, it's the property that the person is living in, and it's their care needs that matter, rather than the tenure of their their, their rental, or whether they're owner-occupier, or what, whether it's a social house, a landlord, social landlord, or a private landlord, actually that shouldn't matter, what should matter is what they need in order to, retain, to remain at home safely, um, and uh, I think the, the housing component of integration has perhaps been a kind of a kind of later addition to the um, to, to be around the table, but they are certainly around the table now. Um, in terms of engagement directly with landlords, I think there's more work to be done on that. But essentially, you know, the the decisions to put in aids and adaptations to a property should not it should not matter what the tenure of that property is. It should be about what what the person themselves needs. Rather than so, so it's probably fair to say it's something which is less reflected in housing um, housing contribution statements in that generally the focus there has been the RSL sector or um, council or owner-occupied. Um, it, it is particularly challenging in the context of the private rented sector because of their desire, I guess, to be able to rent the place, the, the residence again. Uh, and so it does take you into some conversations about tenancy as, as, as well. The, the 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 discussion around housing, though, over the, over the last twelve months has developed really quite quickly, um, as increasingly people are seeing um, housing with support as probably over time the replacement for what residential care currently does. Um, and the other component, which has been quite interesting, is the approach to aids and adaptations, because historically the approach would be to to go and almost do like a health and safety audit and then do everything to the house. Mm -hmm. But when we've had the, when when lo local systems have had the conversation about what the individual feels that they need, they tend to ask for a lot less, mm -hmm. and they tend to believe that they've got more capacity and capability as a consequence of it. So uh, actually approaching the issue in a different way and thinking about the potential for rehabilitation, and physio and to maintain mobility rather than to adapt, 
is also part of the, the rethinking from the perspective of the individual. But your, your question is in, entirely on point, and there is more work to be done there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Um, Jeff, in your contribution, you talked about sort of uh, fighting the symptoms of increasing demand rather than having a bigger picture approach. And uh, you also referenced Edinburgh. In our last uh, panel discussion, I raised the fact that Edinburgh has some 600 fewer residential care beds than it needs right now, but that comes jarring against sort of tension with planning. Um, I wonder if both yourself and the Cabinet Secretary um, can give us an idea of what discussions you're having with potentially Kevin Stewart and other ministers around that kind of whole systems response to our growing care needs. Without a doubt, there needs to be a bespoke solution for Edinburgh and probably the Lothians more generally, because you you know we have a, a local market here that is very very challenging, and actually um, they're already paying well over the national care home rate in order to secure uh, places within uh, a limited availability, and we also have a um, a very you know a delayed discharge issue within. Uh, Lothian that is, um, you know, accounts for a large percentage of the overall delayed discharge and growing, you know, so it's, you know, it, it has to be, it has to be a bespoke solution. Um, there are a number of um, things being looked at, but it has to be a whole system solution. So we need to look at um, more um, intermediate care. Um, so being able, because a lot of people can still get home, but they need that support. Uh, um, on their on their way home, and also looking at um, some of the changes that are happening with care at home. There is um, uh, more locality based work going on in order to try to secure a more um, uh, sustainable workforce there, in order to keep people in their own homes. And then you have the the ongoing needs of people who are not no longer able to uh, to remain uh, at home. And there's some innovative. Uh, work uh, looking at um, you know, do so for example there is a work going on on a, a, a business case around the concept of what's called a, a training care home um, it was mentioned in the workforce plan um, and this would be a partnership with the universities uh, it's actually a, a Norwegian model that works very very well in Norway that looks at a, a very kind of high high quality training environment where you would have uh, student nurses and student care workers coming through um, a, a training, like a teaching hospital, but a teaching care home. Um, now, that's not going to happen next week, but it potentially could provide a quite a, an interesting new model um, of, uh, of, uh, of high quality but affordable um, uh, care that would also have a, a training and innovative research component to it. So work is ongoing on that to look at how that, that might progress. Uh, so there will have to be some um, short short term work done and we're working very closely with the partnership. Jeff spends a lot of his time working with the Lothian partnerships uh, to try and help them to make some short term progress while these other models of care are, are developing. You're Closer to. I, I suppose a, a couple of items there. I'm not entirely sure where the, the 600 figure comes from because I, I guess it's um, when we benchmark, we, we would say that um, City of Edinburgh probably has slightly less than res residential care home places than elsewhere, but not significantly less. Um, we, we do see this as a system of care issue rather than an individual component. And I guess one of the reflections I would have on how other similar solutions have been resolved in the City of Edinburgh is, um, you know, like some of you may have done this as well, I, I came to university here a number of years ago and um, was in private rented accommodation. Um, if I would, was to come to university here now, I would be in one of the 20 or 30 you know, purpose-built student accommodation. So they've resolved one component of the accommodation and land problem so there's really the potential to to resolve these but it requires that system solution um we do spend quite a lot of our time talking about city of edinburgh mm -hmm. and so you, uh, the 
600 figure came from. It came from, um, well, a rebuttal uh, to um, an oral deputation I made to Edinburgh City Council Planning Committee in objection to a particular care home in my constituency because of where it was located, the impact on local health services and the rest of it. And that, that was used as the overriding argument to councillors to, well, reject my objection, as it were. So uh, that sticks very viscerally with me. Um, a, a very specific question then on that, because that was a 64-bed care home in Cramond, just off White House Road. And uh, one of the reasons I uh, sort of went into bat for the community in opposition to that care home, not that I have an ideological objection to the development of new care homes in my constituency, but the problem with that was the um, impact on the, the Cram and Medical Centre is that they had no capacity um, to deal with potentially 100 new patients um, who had high-end needs. Is there specific guidance um, to new care home developers about patients bringing their doctors with them if they're reasonably close, or, or how local health services can respond to the imposition that some of them feel of a new care home in their area? So there's a couple of things on this. As part of the, quite a lot of the dementia work, one of the issues that we were looking at in terms of the quality of medical care within care homes was the fact exactly that people did take their doctors with them as they moved, and there were, that brought with it particular challenges about access and engagement. So, so our, our general assessment is it does make sense for there to be um, practices which have, are connected to particular care homes, but those practices, practices then need to take appropriate account of what the requirements are likely to be. And I guess you know the cabinet secretaries talked about the talked about the nursing component earlier, but you know, looking into the future, you're looking at AHP, physiotherapy, you're looking at social care, you're looking at general practice, geriatricians, uh, and probably some specialist geriatricians in the um, um, psychogeriatric sort of space. So you are looking to think about, and you know, that's part of the purpose of integration, is to enable you to build that sort of mix of services rather than think um, <coughs> it, it, for a particular locality, rather than think about how many of this and how many of that do I have? So I, I think that is part of the future. I, I, I guess I just wonder, was the particular home that you were objecting to, was it also um, a private home probably for yes. privately purchased places? Because again, that's another component of the, of the Edinburgh story, which is the development of an increasing number of um, homes which are only intended for privately funded um, um, occupancy. Thank you very much. Pardon me. Uh, thank you, Convener, and thanks for coming along this afternoon to uh, to us. Um, just for a start, um, just for clarity, the earlier discussion on the UK apprenticeship levy, my understanding is that that's a training levies are reserved and that's a UK levy tax and the Scottish Government doesn't get any additional funding streams as a consequence of that, for example, to fund modern or foundation apprenticeships. Is that your understanding? Uh, I think there has been some... Um negotiation around that in terms of uh, what would then come to us but it's been a quite a difficult set of discussions as I understand it uh, but the point that, that Jeff was making uh, was that that um, there should be no detriment to the uh, the employer because of its inclusion within the national care home contract discussion um, so, so, so my, my understanding and um it's sometimes difficult to be an expert on everything all the time because we've, we've had the conversation before, is that the benefit of the levy le le levied in Scotland is meant to be applied in Scotland, whether that's through um, reserved powers or through devolved powers. But we would need to write to you to all make sure. As doing is replacing funding that was there through exactly. Barnet anyway. Exactly. So there's no additional. Yeah. So there's no new, yeah. it's not new money. Yeah, it's exactly. Just, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's clear. Thank you for cl clarifying that. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk around the area of... Um, well, the, the, the outcome being delayed discharge, and it's good to see some numbers out uh, for December last year showing we're 10% reduction in delayed discharge. So we're obviously some progress going in the right direction. Um, but it was a specifically about um, the area of flexibility around the, the, the care home contracts that you've kind of alluded to, because clearly you're looking at rough numbers. It costs the same to have somebody in an acute bed for a day as it does to have them in a care home for a week. So clearly there's a, there's a, there's a huge disparity there and the more people that can be moved through that process, the better. And if there are blockages there, it was really to assess what you, how much you feel of that blockage is down to um, issues around about the, the, 
the amount of money that's paid to, to care home providers because there could be situations on the margin where a certain service costs a bit more, but they're stuck in an acute bed that's costing seven or eight times more because of the blockage and lack of flexibility around the contract. So is there, is there work to be done there to, to allow some more flexibility so that more delayed discharges can be can be actioned? So, I mean, the picture on delayed discharge, first of all, you're right that there's, you know, there's been continual reductions in, in delayed discharge and they're generally running at like 10% below the previous year and 34 out of the last 35 months have seen bed days associated with delay um, below the equivalent month of the previous year, all of which is good. However, as I alluded to earlier on, um, there are pockets where the, a smaller and smaller number of partnerships are now accounting for a larger and larger number of the remaining delays. Um, and the City of Edinburgh and Lothian is one of those. Um, and that's why we need a bespoke solution to, to resolve that. In terms of the work going on around the, the cost of care calculator, so there, there, will be, there is a negotiation around this year's national care home contract rate, which is ongoing and will reach a conclusion. But alongside that is work going on around the cost of care calculator. And part of that is around uh, the actual cost of care, but, but recognising within that there will be um, variation in terms of locality. So the cost in Edinburgh is different from the cost somewhere else. So, the, so it's about building in enough flexibility. And then you have a growing complex uh, care needs so the because people are older uh, and more have more complex needs before they go into a, a residential care home place by definition their needs are going to be greater and that has to be reflected more within the cost of care calculator so all of that is trying to be wrapped up into um you know this this quite difficult complex piece of work the other thing we're trying to look at you know about well so do you wrap up the the nursing component of that and just include it in the rate or do you provide that in a different way through locality based teams that are NHS employed and that is part of the discussion um, that is ongoing because I think we have to think a bit more innovatively around that uh, and again that would add a bit of complexity to so what what's what does the, the, the national care home rate then pay for and what does it not pay for? What is provided directly through a staffing uh, component that might be NHS uh, employed? But there's obviously a, a, a cost then that you would expect the, the care home sector to either meet or deduct from the place. So, so it is quite complex. But I guess in summary, what I'm saying to you is this is a, a critical um, way of resolving, I think, over the medium to long term this annual debate around what the, the rate is. We need to move away from that and look at more of a framework solution, I think, that takes into account palliative care needs, complex care needs, and local variation in the, in the market as well. That's clear. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Could, could I offer something just on it? Because there's, there's two quite interesting fact, uh, aspects to that, which is, um, first of all, if we, if we have an inappropriate admission to a care home, uh, one that could have been avoided, that will probably cost upwards of £60,000, um, just on the basis that you know, people will then be in a care home for an extended... So if you're thinking in terms of the financial costs mm -hmm. rather than the human costs, um, you know, the, the cost of an inappropriate referral, because somebody once having been referred to the care home will probably stay there, are quite significant, and also in terms of overall system dynamics. The other side which is interesting is that you know, one of the early bits of work that we saw under integration was the work in Glasgow around Step Down, mm -hmm. which used residential care as a process by which people would m be assessed within a non-hospital setting for, in respect of their needs and then move on. And they've seen a significant reduction in the number of people who, having gone through Step Down, have then gone on to residential care. So you get the benefit both of better flow, but also people are more likely to return home um, with the capacity and with the support that that means. So as a, in terms of the human benefit, but also... So I, th I think the, the simple translation for weekly cost to individual, it's a really important thing and we have to always have it at the front of our minds, but you need, we need to think about it in the bigger picture again. Thank you. Brian River. Good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary and Mr Huggins. And as you alluded to earlier on, as we heard in an earlier uh, evidence session, it, it sort of the evolution of the services that are happening in the care homes is, is very quick. Um, and that, um, you know, the, the, the complex care needs are, 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 are ever-growing and the age in which um, people are, are coming into care homes is, 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 is going up. 
the, the care homes themselves have a, a, a sort of limited flex around uh, the costs, uh, uh, how much their income is, and how much their staffing is. And I know that uh, within my, my my own region, we've lost a couple of care homes um, under the uh, under under the banner that that, that the, the welcome introduction of the living wage uh, wasn't fully mitigated against, and given that the, the staffing levels are a, a big percentage of the costs within the care home sector that's put put a strain on it and I wonder if you recognize that strain um, and as I said earlier on that if that's continued it's unsustainable and which speaks to Ivan McKee's point that um, without without that that bed the cost to the NHS of staying within an acute care system is, is much increased and I wonder if you if that's something you could comment on um, well I mean, let me ad address the, the the living wage issue first of all, which you know has um, been quite a controversial decision for government to essentially provide public money to the private sector to help them pay their staff the living wage. It sometimes feels a bit counterintuitive that they would then complain about that. <laughs> Maybe it's just me, but you know I think that has been the right thing to do because it is important to sustain the workforce. Um, I don't think they would have been able to deliver the living wage without that public subsidy, if you like. We are very clear that money then needs to find its way to uh, the front line, to the staff, and the the health and care partnerships are very clear that as part of their uh, negotiation, that you know that money has to go where it was intended. Uh, to go and in terms of the you know the figures um, in 2016-17 we allocated 250 million pounds uh, for social care in the current financial year almost half a billion pounds of frontline NHS spend is being invested in social care and integration which also covers uh, the, the living wage as a component uh, of that and to support that this 18-19 we're going to give an additional 66 million uh, for social care again part of which is to increase the payments, uh, maintain the payment of the of the living wage and ensure that that uh, continues to benefit the 40,000 people who were previously not getting uh, the living wage. And on top of that, you know, despite what we've said about, you know, so and recognising some of the complexity of care costs, you know, the National Care Home contract has increased by over 13% over the last three years, which, you know, is is a significant increase not replicated elsewhere. So I'm not saying I don't recognise some of the challenges, but I think there needs to be a bit of a recognition also of what government has done in terms of stepping into that space that's not seen anywhere else uh, in these islands. And there are the same pressures elsewhere. So whether it's the increase in the National Care Home contract and we, we pay a higher level here, even before the increase this next year that's been negotiated, than is paid elsewhere in the UK and we pay uh, also a contribution to the living wage. So um, I, I guess um, what I'm saying to you is that I think um, there are business um, decisions that are being made within the sector, um, some of which are, are difficult. Um, and it's sometimes as easy, I think, as Jeff alluded to earlier on, to turn and blame the government for, for some of the challenges um, which I think is not always uh, a fair assessment of, of the situation. I think it's also important just to remember that the National Care Home contract took account of the, the living wage yeah. changes and in the first year that we undertook it because of the representations that we had about small or rural or single care home owners, one of the things which we added to the agreement was that if there were particular challenges to particular providers because of the structure mm -hmm. and because of the you know, changes in, in what was being required, that there would be open to local negotiation. So, mm -hmm. so we, we, we directly re referenced that and understood that. If, if I could just to clarify, Cabinet Secretary, I wasn't blaming, I wasn't putting blaming anyone. I was putting, I was, I was merely passing on information that's come from uh, care homes themselves to say that even though that even though you you might have put money aside uh, to, to to pay the living wage, the suggestion is it's not necessarily making its way uh, to where it should be, or or and indeed is mitigating against, and it's putting that that strain has cost. Uh, not just not just in my area, but but that, that's a, a recognition across uh, many areas. It's becoming increasingly difficult to maintain, uh, you know, the care, the care home system. 
I think the solution here is around the, the cost of care calculator, bringing a level of transparency to all aspects of this, not just in terms of what is paid through the, the National Care Home contract, but transparency around what is now a reasonable profit level, for example, for the independent sector to take, because there is huge variation there. You have uh, over you know the last few years some where uh, I accept the... The, the margins have been very, very tight indeed, but you have other providers where actually quite a healthy profit has been taken. And we need to bring a transparency to all of that so that we can make sure the public contribution we make is leading to a, um, an improvement in quality of care, that staff are paid the living wage, but that you know there is a, a reasonable return uh, on the, the uh, uh, for the, the provider where there is a, a profit element involved, which obviously not, not all uh, providers have. So, you know, uh, I think the, that is the reason the cost of care calculator is so important in bringing transparency to all of these things. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ashton. Thank you, convener. I suppose, coming back to the sort of future sustainability idea, and I, I guess I'm talking more into the medium and long term, that you know, clearly we need to do some work around maybe identifying the, what these innovative new models of care might be. And obviously, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has already mentioned one example from Norway, which does sound really interesting. Are there other um, ideas or pilots, projects that are being used in other countries that perhaps Scotland could learn from that maybe the government are looking at? I think uh, we have been very open to looking at uh, best practice elsewhere. So the, the Burtzorg uh, model that we've um, been trialling here around the idea of really empowering um, the frontline staff working in a, more of a care at home environment, that they would manage their caseload um, um, and be able to make those changes and adjustments to, to care um, that enables a more rapid changes if someone needs more care or less care so that they essentially can um, um, be making more of the kind of frontline decisions around care rather than passing it back to kind of three sets of managers and so on and that and the time that that sometimes takes so so we've looked at that um, in terms of the the care home sector I am very taken with the, the idea uh, as you probably can guess because I've probably mentioned it three or four times now of looking at um, more of a, what are the skills needed to support an ever more increasing complexity within a care home environment rather than who employs them? Uh, and I think the reality is even with the promotion of um, the, the benefits and the attractiveness of a nursing career within the care home sector, I still think even with all of that, there's going to be a there's going to be challenges because the NHS the, is a very attractive proposition for nurses because of the um, the career opportunities and diversity of, of opportunity there. Um, and I think, therefore, the, the idea of locality-based teams, not just of nurses but of other skill sets, providing um, that to uh, the, the care homes and nursing homes within that locality, for me, is, is a very strong proposition in, in terms of a, of a way forward. Now, that's already happening in some areas, um, but um, I would like us to, to look at if, if that is a, a viable proposition, and obviously we're increasing the, the number of uh, training posts for, for nurses, so we're increasing the workforce overall, so we'd have to, you know, there are always demands on the nursing workforce, so we have to recognise that, but I think we could make that quite an attractive proposition um, for for nurses and other uh, allied health professionals as well, which would increase quality, would bring sustainability, and potentially would be a way of um, uh, avoiding the care home sector having to pay agency nurse rates in, in one case of £1,200 a night. That is not sustainable, and we recognise that. Thank you very much. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener. Into you both. Can I raise a general point about the Improvement Hub, which, as you know, Cabinet Secretary was set up almost two years ago by Health Improvement Scotland. I mentioned in the last session that I watched the online presentation last night, which I thought was first class on things like sepsis and the new FIT procedures for bowel screening. But is it the right um, vehicle to manage change in the sector, or is it just one factor in the whole equation of change within the care sector? 
I think it's probably one one factor. Um, although you're right, it does some it does some really really good work. Um, and I guess what we would want local partnerships to do is to kind of analyse their own problems, if you like, so you know, so that they know um, what their uh, local needs are and where they're got challenges, where they've got strengths and where they've got weaknesses, and to ask for support. Um, I think the, the partnerships that ask for support the most are the ones that are actually getting on and doing the best. And perhaps where there's been a reluctance to ask for support is where we've seen most of the challenges. Um, and it should never be seen as a weakness to actually ask for support. It should be seen as a strength that you've, you know, you've identified where your challenges are and you actually want support in, in overcoming those. Um, and you know, some of our strongest performing partnerships have actually asked and received some quite significant support. So, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a good question. The, the frailty work also that the IHUB has done in a pallet basis in Fife has also been really effective and we see it as one of the reasons for the improvement in a number of the, the indicators there, but it goes alongside the data work and the objective of creating capability for change within local partnerships. Could, could I add something just to the to the previous qu question? Two, two, two or three things which we're seeing is greater use of technology, looking also across the um, housing solution, care home solution, community hospital solution, but also mixed use environments. One, one of the uh, one of the areas that we've we you know we, we we've become aware of in England that they developed a Italian restaurant as part of a mixed use environment and as part of the overall funding model, which apparently made eight thousand pounds during its opening weekend. So 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 you're beginning so if you begin to think that you don't have to do it the way in which you always did it, but you can find different ways to and and I guess the other component of that is where you locate um, care. You know, do you take it to the outskirts of the town or, or do you try and put it in locations where people are able to tap into other sorts of facilities as well? So there's a, there's a lot going on, but it will, it will learn, but it will also be bespoke. Thank you very much. Uh, Emma Hart. Thank you, Convener. I'll, I just have a quick question. We now use the language of models of care and it, it just trips off our tongue quite easily. It's a common language that we use. But I'm wondering how... Has there been a need identified that people don't still understand what changes of care means as far as respite in the home versus respite in a place? Or it's not just about bricks and mortar, it's not about dementia care in a place, it's about the wider connectivity to the community and everything. So I'm just wondering if there's a role or a further remit required to maybe do more public engagement and awareness raising regarding the language that we are using for better care models. Yeah, I, I, someone mentioned the language earlier on, it might have been Sandra, I'm not sure. Um, and I think there's something in that, that rather than compartmentalising, you know, this is that, this is that, it actually it, it should be about the, the care needs of, of the person and whether or not uh, where they receive respite, it, it should be tailored to, to what their needs are. And I think, you know, we started off by saying um, that you can't look at one part of the system in isolation. You know, it has to be, you have to look at the whole the whole system. Um, so there's definitely something in that, I think, and, and perhaps changing some of the, the language or adapting some of the language. And I think it's a more general issue as well, because we talk about going to the hospital or seeing the doctor. And, you know, there are other options. There's pharmacy. Uh, I, I, in the social care side, one of the things which I find really interesting is just how surprised people are often by what they receive and how pleased they are with what they receive. And, and it, it's a surprise because it's not hadn't been their understanding of what this was. Mm -hmm. So uh, speaking to a, a colleague whose um, mother had returned from hospital and lived in a terraced house and had expected to need adaptations, but instead got rehab. Um, and the consequence of that was six to seven weeks later was able to go up and down the stairs and had the capacity to use the whole house. Mm -hmm. And that was like uh, that was just you know a mind blowing outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's you know that's normal. But it's it's not the dialogue that we have about. So it's it's quite one of one of my one of my one of my colleagues um, about ten years ago suggested we should do a documentary soap to explain. Um, but we I don't think the broadcasters would necessarily find that to be a <laughs> to to be. It's it's really quite hard to to, to get across. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, that's been a very full session. Can I thank the uh, cabinet secretary and Mr. Huggins for their attendance? And we will now move into private section. Thank you very much.